The past is just a story we tell ourselves, and this is a story I'm telling you. Assassin's Creed is a franchise that loves adventuring through the ages, retelling historical events through the eyes of the Order of the Assassins. So what we're gonna do today is step into our own animus and take a trip to the past. Yep, we're gonna marathon our way through all of the leaderboards Assassin's Creed videos. There will be timelines, there will be family trees, there will be facts, oh, so many facts. And of course, there will be plenty of diving from high places into conveniently squishy landing zones. Welcome back to the leaderboard. My name is Keegan, and today we've got a full Assassin's Creed marathon for ya. If you like what you see, make sure to click that like button, and if you want to see more, make sure you subscribe. Let's get started. First things first, it's important that we lay some groundwork. To do so, we're going to take a look at an Assassin's Creed timeline. This one covers events up until the Odyssey DLC, so it's not entirely complete, but it will get those gears turning. Remember, nothing is true, everything is permitted. The creation of the human race, approximately 75,101 BCE or 2195 Isu era. Before there were humans, there were the Isu. Members of the first civilization, the Isu are also known as the precursors, or simply as those who came before. This ancient race of highly advanced beings was better than humans in every way. They possessed superior intelligence, six primary senses, and to top it off, a triple helix DNA structure. My high school biology class didn't quite cover how this compares to our measly double helix DNA, but we at least know that they lived a long time. During this period, the Isu bred a slave race known as Homo sapiens. That's us. They were fashioned in the image of the Isu and bred to be as obedient and resilient as cattle. Their words, not mine. In order to keep the human race in their power, the Isu used various technologies known to us as pieces of Eden. Some pieces, such as the apples and the staves, were used as mind control devices, with the ability to tap into a human's brain through a network of neurotransmitters, ensuring total obedience. Other pieces, such as the Swords of Eden, grant charisma and leadership to its wielder, as well as a host of energy-blasting powers, while the Shrouds of Eden are capable of extraordinary restoration and healing. However, there seemed to be a little problem in the lab, as some humans were born without these neurotransmitters, consequently making them immune to the pieces' mind control capabilities. These humans were known as human Isu hybrids. The War in the Garden of Eden, 75,010 BCE or 2,296 Isu era. It turned out that those neurotransmitters were pretty important, because far from being docile cattle, the human race were an aggressive bunch that did not take well to the whole enslavement thing. And sometime in 75,010 BCE, BCE, two human Isu hybrids named Adam and Eve, you know the ones, led the humans in a rebellion against the Isu to fight for humanity's free will. Together, they stole one of the apples of Eden, and thus began the human Isu war. But only after a decade of fighting, the two races were forced to come to a halt. The Isu had known of an impending calamity that was to come, and three Isu scientists, Juno, Jupiter, and Minerva, had joined forces to stay out of the war and form the Capitoline Triad, with its sole purpose being the prevention of their civilization destruction. Together, they experimented and tested a number of solutions, with the most promising results being the construction of underground temples, or vaults, spread across the globe. The Great Catastrophe, 75,000 BCE or 2,306 Isu era. Fast forward 10 years later to the Great Catastrophe, also known as the Toba Catastrophe, or the first disaster. The Earth was hit with a coronal mass ejection, an eruption of plasma from the sun's outermost layer that saw the near total extinction of both humans and Isu. In 75,000 BCE, the solar flare that hit the Earth flipped its magnetic field and exposed the planet to the sun's deadly radiation, essentially burning the planet and causing untold catastrophic destruction. Those that did survive returned to a barren planet, and the Isu, already fewer in numbers than the humans, were on the brink of extinction. Together, both the Isu and humans humans worked to rebuild the planet. The Capitoline Triad, seeking to prevent this tragedy from ever happening again, constructed the Eye, a planetary shield device that could be used in the future to deflect the next solar flare. Unfortunately, one of the scientists, Juno, had other plans for the human race. Juno was what one would call an Isu supremacist. She wished to eliminate the human race for daring to rise up against the Isu. Juno had no intention of saving the human race, but instead planned to rule over them after the next disaster. Discovering her plan, Minerva Jupiter imprisoned Juno into the Grey, a kind of limbo or afterlife realm for the Isu. They then built a second eye to relay their warnings to the future human race. The Peloponnesian War, Ancient Greece, Assassin's Creed Odyssey 1, 431 to 404 BCE. Over 50,000 years have gone by and the Isu have all but passed into myth. It's 431 BC, the start of the Peloponnesian War. 
For those of you that played any of the God of War games, you'll be familiar with the long-standing rivalry between Athens and Sparta. Alexios, or Cassandra, depending on who you decide to play, is a Mystheus, a mercenary taking odd jobs, and specifically not a capital A assassin. I'm going with Cassandra because Obviously. As the grandchild of the legendary warrior king Leonidas, Cassandra was raised as a true Spartan. Turns out her granddad Leonidas was a human Isu hybrid, and his spear, which Cassandra inherits, links back to the first civilization. Unfortunately, that was the high point of her childhood. In 446 BC, an oracle working for the cult of Cosmos predicted the Spartan downfall at the hands of Cassandra's younger brother, Alexios. Well, everyone buys the oracle story, and Alexios is sentenced to be thrown off a cliff. Cassandra tries to save him, but ends up knocking Alexios and the Spartan councilman over the edge. She's deemed a traitor, and her father, Nikolaus, throws her off the cliff himself. They clearly survived, but a job from a wealthy client leads Cassandra to a slew of awkward family reunions all over Greece as she learns about and crosses paths with the Cult of Cosmos. The cult wants Leonidas' bloodline dead and are using Alexios as their enforcer. He's going by Demos these days, but he's still very much alive. In 429 BC, working to end cult influence in Spartan and Athenian territories, Cassandra meets her real father, famed mathematician and thinker Pythagoras. He stayed alive well beyond his years thanks to an Isu artifact, the Staff of Hermes. Pythagoras tells Cassandra they're standing amid the ruins of Atlantis, an Isu city they are destined to protect. To seal Atlantis off forever and keep its secrets from cult hands, Pythagoras has Cassandra track down four precursor artifacts. She tangles with Grecian legends including the Sphinx, the Greek one, the Cyclops, the Minotaur, and Medusa. Simultaneously, Cassandra and her mother, Myrene, track the cult sages all over Greece, getting entangled in local politics and learning more about the Ghost of Cosmos, the cult's elusive leader. Sometime before 422 BC, Cassandra avenges the death of Athenian general Pericles, who was assassinated by Demos. She destroys Pericles' political rival and cult associate, Cleon. After Demos tries to kill her numerous times, Cassandra tries reconciling with him. Whether she's successful or not, Cassandra reunites the rest of her family. At a celebratory dinner for the reunion and triumph over the cult, Peace is established and the war between Athens and Sparta is over. Cassandra returns to the cult sanctuary to destroy their Isu pyramid, but when she touches it, she receives a vision of Pythagoras. He explains the cult's origins and the eternal need for balance between chaos and order. Pythagoras also sees a vision where future assassins, inspired by Cassandra, carry on their legacy of chaos. The assassins are the chaos in the situation. Aspasia, Pericles' lover, comes forward as the ghost of Cosmos. Cassandra then destroys the cult's pyramid and stops Aspasia and her plans for good, whether by killing her, letting her go, or uh, kissing her. Activating the precursor artifacts to seal Atlantis unlocks a message from Isu Atlantean ruler Aletheia. She says Isu technology isn't meant for human use, and asks Pythagoras to pass the staff of Hermes to Cassandra so Atlantis can be sealed. Pythagoras hesitates to close so much knowledge off from the world, but ultimately gives Cassandra the staff and finally dies. Legacy of the First Blade with Atlantis sealed, Cassandra sets sail for Macedonia. She crosses paths with the Order of the Ancients, who seek the assassin Darius and his son Natakus, or Nema if you're playing as Alexius. Back in 465 BC, Darius was braided a traitor by the Order after a failed attempt to assassinate Artaxerxes, the new Persian king and son of Xerxes. He was an oppressive ruler manipulated by the Order, but Darius assassinated him with the first known use of the hidden blade. Darius feared, like father like son, but Artaxerxes got away. Finding Darius was a happy coincidence, as the Order's mercenary, the Huntsman, was in Macedonia. This guy tracks and kills tainted ones, those with Isu hybrid bloodlines, who the Order sees as having the power to destroy the world. And this time, he's on the hunt for Cassandra. So she, Darius, and Natakas team up and hunt down the Huntsman first. After the three settle on the nearby island of Achaea, Cassandra and Natakas have a child of their own, Elpidios. Unfortunately, Order member Amorgus discovers where they live and brings the full weight of the Order down on them. Natakas is killed trying to keep Elpidios from being kidnapped during the attack. Cassandra and Darius head off to the Order's headquarters in Messenia and kill Amorgus, but he reveals the Order isn't just a group, it's an idea that will outlive any person. Cassandra figures this means they'll always be hunted, so she asks Darius to take Elpidios away to raise him safely. They part ways with Darius and Elpidios settling in Egypt and starting a lineage that leads to the assassin Aya, later Amunet. Meanwhile, 
Things get mythical with Cassandra. Alethea insists that as the new keeper of the staff of Hermes, she must learn how to wield its full power. She sends Cassandra into a simulation of the sister realms, Elysium, Hades, and Atlantis. Their ancient Isu empires hostile to Eden's government, but they exist alongside each other and bow to Mount Olympus' authority. The Isu Persephone runs the heavenly afterworld, Elysium, with an iron grip. With the help of Hermes, another god slash Isu, Cassandra learns more about the staff, but trouble is brewing on two fronts. Adonis leads the dead heroes in rebellion against Persephone, and spooky Hecate, supposedly Persephone's right-hand woman, plots to take over Elysium and blame Cassandra. Hermes demands Persephone use her key, an apple of Eden, to open the gateway between Elysium and Hades so Cassandra can continue learning. Eventually, Persephone tosses Hermes off a bridge to his doom, and later tosses Cassandra into the Black Pit to deal with the underworld's guardian, Cerberus. Cassandra defeats Cerberus, but that leaves the dark realm of Hades vulnerable. Rifts open up, allowing souls normally held in Tartarus, basically hell, to roam throughout the underworld. Hades, the guy, not the realm, tasks Cassandra with finding guardians for the underworld gates, but he's got no intention of helping them. He just plans to trap Cassandra as the new guardian. I mean, she did kill the old one. Anyway, those two do battle until Poseidon appears and whisks Cassandra off to Atlantis. With tensions brewing between Isu and their human servants, Poseidon attempts to smooth Atlantis' rocky political situation by the half-Isu, Cassandra, as Dicosti's second-in-command. She's in charge of enforcing laws and passing judgment on the city, working alongside Poseidon's nine sons as they work as Archons managing city affairs. Poseidon encourages Cassandra to learn more, but she only uncovers all the atrocities the Isu committed against humans. The worst is the Olympos Project, run by Juno and her husband, Eta. To make humanity fear the gods and keep them subservient, they abducted people, turned them into hybrid monsters, and unleashed them on the public. Poseidon subdues Juno and Eta himself, but after destroying their latest creation, Cassandra decides Atlantis doesn't deserve to exist at all. Fully grasping the power of the staff, she completely destroys the city. Out of the 18th century and into the new millennium of the once proud bloodlines of assassins have culminated in Desmond Miles. Ptolemaic Egypt, Assassin's Creed, Origins. 330 BCE, 100 years after the Peloponnesian War, Alexander the Great has come to invade Egypt and start what would be known as the Ptolemaic Dynasty. The dynasty begins with Ptolemy the I, a Greek general and companion of Alexander the Great, and ending with Ptolemy the Thirteenth. In 51 BCE, Ptolemy the Thirteenth co-ruled Egypt with his older sister and wife, Cleopatra, because that's how things were done back then. Cleopatra was infinitely more popular than her brother, and by 48 BCE, Ptolemy had her deposed, sending Egypt into civil war. During this tumultuous era lived Bayek and Maji, a member of the elite paramilitary police force in Egypt. Together with his wife, Aya, they protect the people from civil unrest caused by two opposing rulers. In 49 BCE, Bayek is charged with protecting the Siwa Oasis, a village that houses the Temple Amun. While on patrol with his son, Bayek gets abducted by masked men and brought to the Temple of Amun. Unbeknownst to him, the temple is a vault of the first civilization, and the orb that the men carry, an apple of Eden. In the ensuing scuffle, Bayek manages to escape but accidentally stabs his son, killing him. Vowing revenge, Bayek and Aya uncover the identities of all of the men and kill them, one by one. With only the final target left to kill, their journey brings them to Cleopatra herself. It turns out that she was ousted by the same band of masked men, who call themselves the Order of Ancients, and seek to control all of Egypt, using Ptolemy as their puppet. Swearing fealty to Cleopatra, Bayek and Aya depose of the remaining Order members. But after going through all that trouble, they find that Cleopatra has aligned herself with the invading Roman Julius Caesar, as well as the Order of Ancients. With the Order in power, their goals of controlling the human race by activating the orb and staff found in the tomb of Alexander the Great could now come to pass. Gathering people sympathetic to their cause, Bayek and Aya form the makings of the first Assassin Brotherhood to counter the Order and defend the free will of the people. The pair parts ways, but takes with them the foundation of the Brotherhood, vowing to always protect the world from the shadows. The Third Crusade, Assassin's Creed 1, 1190 to 1191 AD. We arrive at the Third Crusade over a millennium later in 1190 AD. In the Holy Lands of Jerusalem, the Assassin Brotherhood is still at war with the Order of the Ancients, now known as the Templar Order. The Brotherhood has grown in the last millennia, but their mission remains the same, to preserve the freedom of the people. Here, we meet Altair ibn Lahad, Master Assassin of the Levantine Brotherhood of Assassins 
assassins. He's been tasked with obtaining an ancient artifact with the ability to control minds, now in the hands of the Templars. Sound familiar? That's because it's the Apple of Eden from the time of the Isu. Unfortunately, during his mission, he encounters Robert de Sableau, Grand Master of the Knights Templar. Bad decisions are made, and even though they are able to bring the Apple back to the Brotherhood, it results in the death and serious injury of his fellow assassins. Demoted in the ranks of the Brotherhood by his mentor, Al Mu'alim, Altair must redeem himself by helping to kill a list of people in the city. Well, it's not called the Assassin's Guild for nothing. Each name that he checks off leads him deeper and deeper into the Templar's plot to completely take over the Holy Land. With Robert, Grand Master of the Templars as his last kill, Altair finally learns the truth about his mentor, Al Mu'alim. A member of the Templar Order, Al Mu'alim had used Altair to get rid of the other Order members to keep the Apple of Eden for himself. Confronting his former mentor, Altair swiftly takes care of the treacherous Al Mu'alim, and in his attempt to destroy the Apple, activates it to uncover the location of all the other pieces of Eden spread across the world. The Italian Renaissance, Assassin's Creed II, 1476 to 1499 AD. We move a couple of centuries ahead to the mid 14th century at the start of the Italian Renaissance. Italy is undergoing a period of great cultural change and the country stands at the forefront of many modern day artistic, scientific, and philosophical discoveries. It's here that a young Ezio Auditore da Firenze, bloodline of the late Altair ibn La Ahad, is born. Fast forward a couple of years to 1476 AD. Ezio, now a budding youth, has just witnessed the death of his father and brothers in an act of treason against a corrupt magistrate. With his last words, his father instructs him to uncover the family's secrets and his assassin heritage. Vowing to revenge his family, Ezio trains as an assassin and tracks down the men responsible. The man, Rodrigo Borgia, head of the Italian Rite of the Templar Order, has amassed considerable power in Europe, even rising to the position of Pope and head of the Catholic Church. If that wasn't considerable power enough, he has in his possession an Apple of Eden, as well as the Papal Staff, which is a Staff of Eden. Armed with both pieces, he plans to unlock one of the vaults of the Isu, where he believes great power lies. It's the turn of the century when Ezio eventually tracks down and literally beats up Rodrigo in battle. But for some reason, Ezio forgets he's an assassin because instead of killing Rodrigo, he takes the Apple and the Staff of Eden and sets him free. With the pieces now in his possession, he's able to open the vault in battle. Vatican City, where he encounters the Isu Minerva, preserved in the eye. She tells him of the great catastrophe that almost wiped out the planet and forewarns him and a certain future assassin of the incoming doom. Oof, I am getting stressed out already. You know what? Let's take a break from all this doomsday talk and chill out with some audiobooks on Audible. You already know Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but have you checked out THE Odyssey? Like by Homer. No! There's a few different versions on Audible, but I recommend the one narrated by Ian McKellen. Gandalf reading ancient Greek literature? <laughs> you can't go wrong. And you also can't go wrong with the biography of Leonardo da Vinci. We all know he was Ezio's best friend who created all his Bond-esque assassin gadgets, but he also painted some stuff. Well, okay, I'm glossing over a lot here, but I promise you'll get a much more thorough story by listening to Walter Isaacson's Leonardo da Vinci. But if you couldn't care less about all the history in Assassin's Creed, then you can just listen to one of the many novelizations of the games. They build out the main games with all kinds of side stories. That's cool and all, but I recommend The Last Descendant series by Matthew J. Kirby. It's a totally new Assassin's Creed story that takes place in the modern day. Start listening to cool stories like these with a 30-day Audible trial. Your first audiobook plus two Audible original are free. Visit audible.com slash the leaderboard or text the leaderboard, all one word, to 500, 500. Again, that's audible.com slash the leaderboard or text the leaderboard, one word, to 500, 500. Okay, back to the doomsday story at hand. The Italian Renaissance, Assassin's Creed, Brotherhood, 1499 to 1507 AD. Confused and probably a little freaked out by what he saw, Ezio returns home to hopefully live a quiet life far away from conflict. But unfortunately, his decision to go head to head with the Borgia family comes back to bite him in the butt when his home is attacked by Cesare Borgia, son of Rodrigo. Cesare murders his uncle and steals back the Apple of Eden, leading Ezio to swear vengeance on the Borgia family once again. The Assassin Brotherhood in this era was a shadow of its former glory, and after years of painstaking work, Ezio rebuilds and becomes the mentore of the Italian Brotherhood of Assassins, liberating the people from the hold of the Borgias. After several years, in 1507 AD, the Brotherhood tracked down and retrieved the Apple of Eden from Cesare, who in his lust for power had murdered his own father. Standing atop the battlements, Ezio, in an extremely baller move, drops Cesare off to see if fate will spare him. Spoilers! It did not! Not intending to use the Apple for himself,
itself, Ezio hides it away in an Isu vault underneath the Roman Colosseum. The Italian Renaissance, Assassin's Creed, Revelations, 1511 to 1512 AD. Four years have passed. It's 1511 AD, and Ezio is traveling back to the former Assassin's Fortress and Masia. He's looking to discover the secret library of its mentor, Altair, and the true purpose of the Assassin Brotherhood. At the Masayaf Temple, Ezio finds that the library is locked and is tasked with searching for its five keys. On his journey, he encounters the Templars, who are also hot on the trail for the keys, thus invoking the ancient game of treasure hunt. In the end, our boy outsmarts them and opens the library to find Altair's skeleton and the Apple of Eden. Colonial Era, Caribbean, Assassin's Creed IV, Black Flag, 1715 to 1722 AD. Just a few centuries later, after the Italian Renaissance, the bloodline of Altair have traded their white robes for black flags in the form of Captain Edward Kenway, the most notorious pirate of this time, who, for some reason, has no idea of the Assassin Brotherhood or his connection to them. Around 1715 AD, Captain Edward finds himself stranded on a deserted island with a man named Duncan Walpole after an attack on his ship. Unbeknownst to him, Duncan is a member of the Assassins, and after killing him, he discovered among his possessions some easy bounty. Their a reward for the map he was carrying, so seeing it as an easy trade, Edward went in Duncan's place to collect. Along his journey, he learns of the existence of the Templar Order and discovers that they are searching for an ancient site of the Isu, known as the Observatory, which has the power to locate any person on Earth with a sample of their blood. Legend has it, however, that the blood of a sage is required to enter the Observatory. With not as much effort as you would think, Edward tracks down the sage Bartholomew Roberts, and together they discover the location of the Observatory and retrieve the artifact. Now, it wouldn't be Assassin's Creed without a little betrayal, and in the last moments, the sage turns on Edward and gets him thrown into prison for piracy. As luck would have it, Edward is freed by the mentor of the Assassins, Ah-Tabai, and he joins their cause to eliminate Roberts and the Templars. Edward, now aligned with the Assassins, returns to the observatory to seal it away for good. With his mission done, he travels back to England with his daughter, Jennifer Scott, where he promises to uphold the Assassin's Creed forevermore. The American Revolution Assassin's Creed Rogue, 1752-1776 AD. Set in the midst of the 1750s revolution that would eventually culminate in the formation of the United States of America, a young and brash Irishman kills the already dying Templar commander, Lawrence Washington. Racked with guilt, the assassin, Shea Patrick Cormick, begins to question the motives of the Assassin Brotherhood. With his convictions already weak, they're pushed to the breaking when Shea is tasked with obtaining a piece of Eden in Lisbon. His attempt causes the piece to actually accidentally trigger an earthquake, destroying the city and claiming thousands of innocent lives. Shay, unwilling to let the assassins destroy another city, returns to the homestead and attempts to confront the Brotherhood alone. This was a terrible plan, because in the end, after being grossly outnumbered, he's shot and falls off a cliff. With the luck of the Irish, Shay survives and moves to the gang-infested streets of New York in 1756 AD. Working to help the general populace face down the might of the criminal underworld, Shay attracts the attention of Colonel George Monroe Row, a Templar. Upon learning that the assassins are still after the pieces of Eden, despite the collateral damage that was caused previously, he joins the Templars to stop them. After proving his chops with a string of killings, Shea is inducted into the order by none other than the Grand Master Hytham Kenway, son of the late Edward Kenway. On his command, Shea decimates most of what is left of the Assassin Brotherhood and hunts down the pieces of Eden. Eventually, in 1776 AD, his search takes him to Paris, where he meets Charles Dorian, French assassin and father of Arno Dorian. Shea murders Dorian and obtains the Peace of Eden, sealing his success as a senior member of the Templar Order. The American Revolution, Assassin's Creed III, 1754 to 1783 AD. There's a bit of overlapping time streams at this point, so we'll back it up a couple of years to 1755 AD. This is the birth year of Radon Hakedong, also known by the adopted name of Connor Kenway, son of Haytham Kenway and grandson of Edward Kenway. Radonha Gedong was fathered while Haytham was in the American colonies, searching for the Grand Temple that was actually hidden in his mother's village. When he grows up, he's tasked by their village elder to train as an assassin in order to protect the temple. Over the following years, Radonha Gedong kills several Templars 
and aids in the Revolutionary War between the Patriots and the British. In 1776 AD, he eventually meets his father, and while they're both on opposite ends of the war, he hopes to work together with him to give the people freedom. However, Haytham, being a Templar, believes that freedom will inevitably lead to chaos and is set on replacing George Washington with a Templar. Citing irreconcilable differences, Radon Hakedong kills his father and the last of the colonial Templars and retrieves the key to the Isu Temple. He later returns back to his village to find it abandoned. The only thing left behind by his people was a crystal ball that Connor activates to commune with the Isu, Juno. She tells him he must hide the key to the temple where no one can find it. Burying the key to the temple, Connor sails to New York. French Revolution, Assassin's Creed, Unity, 1776 to 1800 AD. Versailles, 1776 AD. Vive la Révolution! While the country is rioting against the monarchy, an orphaned Arnaud Dorian is falling in love with a young Elise de la Serre, daughter of the Templar Grand Master and his adopted father. Oblivious to his father's heritage as an assassin, Arnaud grows up safe in the bosom of the order for the next 13 years. On the night of his beloved Elise's initiation into the Templar Order, Arnaud discovers the body of the murdered Grand Master. Having been set up to take the fall, he's accused of killing the Grand Master and is subsequently thrown into prison. There, he has the good fortune of meeting Pierre Belec, an assassin. During this pivotal time in French history, the storming of the Bastille in 1789 AD, Arnaud and Pierre break free of captivity. Vowing to find out who had him framed for the De La Serre murder, Arnaud joins Pierre as an assassin. During his investigation, he meets a silversmith named Francois Thomas Germain, a man that claimed to be held hostage hostage by the Templars. Francois, however, is not who he claims to be, as he was not only the one responsible for the De La Serre murder, but is also the sage Bartholomew Roberts reincarnated. The sage, not having the decency to stay dead, is back this time to lead the French in rebellion against the monarchy, as well as take over the Templar order. In order to fight him, Arnaud meets with his old sweetheart, Elise, and convinces her to parley with the Brotherhood to stop the sage. The unity in Assassin's Creed Unity is short lived, however, because as soon as the mentor of the Assassin Brotherhood agrees, your old buddy Pierre, in some sort of fit of jealousy and moral rage, murders his mentor for even considering joining forces with the Templar Order. Everything pretty much disintegrates at this point, and Arno, after killing Belloc, runs away with Elise in a hot air balloon. This is truly a Romeo and Juliet story, if instead of killing themselves, they killed other people. But fairy tale endings have no place during the Revolution, and by 1794 AD, after after a failed attempt and a few months of liquor-infused depression, Arno manages to kill the sage Francois at the cost of Elise. Battling beneath the temple in Paris, Francois manages to kill Elise before Arno can get to him. His consolation prize for the death of the love of his life is an apple of Eden hidden in the temple. Realizing the dangers that the apple could cause if it got into the wrong hands, Arno sends the apple to Al Muhalim, the mentor of the Egyptian Brotherhood of Assassins in Cairo. Yes, there are two people named Al Muhalim that both happen to be assassins in the story. It's confusing. Victorian era, Assassin's Creed, Syndicate, 1868 AD. In foggy London town, 1868 AD, the Assassin Brotherhood has all but fallen, and the city is under the rule of Templar Grand Master Crawford Starrick, who controls both London's industry and the criminal underworld. During this time, two Assassin hopefuls, and amongst the last of the dying Brotherhood, twins Jacob and Evie Fry attempt to loosen the Templar's clutches on the common people by defeating their gangs and sabotaging their Templar-run businesses. Together, the twins build their own syndicate, called the Rooks, enlisting the people of London to fight back. In their fight, Evie runs into Templar David Brewster, who is experimenting on a piece of Eden. Before she assassinates him, he tells her that the Grand Master Starrick knows of a second, more powerful piece of Eden. The first piece of Eden then becomes unstable and explodes, causing Evie to flee. While Jacob is cleaning up the city, Evie learns more about the second piece, known as the Shroud of Eden. Her search takes her to the mansion of Edward Kenway, ex-pirate and assassin. Here she finds a map detailing all the assassin vaults hidden in London and where she must go next. Uncovering the shroud but losing it to the Templars, Evie and Jacob finally track it to Buckingham Palace, where Starrick is attempting to reseal the shroud and kill all of Britain's heads of church and state. Working together, the twins take down Starrick and return the shroud to the vault.
present day. Out of the 18th century and into the new millennium, the once proud bloodline of assassins have culminated in Desmond Miles. The year is 2007, and modern day Templars now run a multinational corporate conglomerate, while former assassin ancestors become deadbeat bartenders. Behind the scenes, the war between the Templar Order and the Assassin Brotherhood rages on, each team vying for the pieces of Eden and to uncover all that the Isu have left behind. Your Assassin's Creed journey begins here with Desmond, but that's a story for another video. With that timeline in mind, how about some facts? It's good to fill in those gaps, especially if you plan on fitting in during a specific time period. Let's get right into it. This is Assassin's Creed facts you should know. Number one. Ubisoft created the Assassin's Creed franchise nine years ago, with the first game being released on November 13th, 2007. Since then, there have been several sequels to the game, along with a movie and comic book series. Number two. The game's conflict revolves around the two ancient secret societies of the Assassins and the Knights of Templar. Number three. The Knights of Templar are introduced early on in the game as they ambush Altair and the two others with him, Malik and his brother from Solomon's Temple, proving that the Knights of Templar are not to be underestimated. Number four. Due to the time period, some people may think that Assassin's Creed is highly religious. The franchise actually takes more of a philosophical approach and states that the Assassins have been around longer than the Christians or Muslims. Number five. The game allows the player to take on the role of Altair, a 12th century assassin. Altair lives in the city of Masayaf during the Third Crusade in the Holy Land. Number six, the actual Third Crusade, which occurred from 1189 to 1192, was the only crusade that the actual Knights of Templar were in. Number seven, the assassins during this time period were called Hassassin, which actually translates to assassins. Talk about a translation that didn't take too much creativity. Number eight, unlike the ones in the game, the actual Hassassins in real life targeted certain people to further their political and religious goals. Number nine, the Hassassin was a secret order of Shiite Muslims led by the missionary Hassi Sabah. These assassins became known for their public killing of their enemies in broad daylight. Number 10. The Hassassin believed they were a religious warrior. The young warriors were given both combat and religious instructions in their training. Number 11. Even though the Assassin's Creed franchise expands throughout time, the real Hassassin lasted only 300 years. During that time, they killed two caliphs, Christian crusader leaders, and numerous viziers. Glad our version of the assassins only stayed in the science fiction game. Number 12. The real Templars started off as a charity to escort pilgrims to the Holy Land. That charity goes a lot further than just helping an old lady across the street. The Knights Templar were known as some of the most skilled fighters of the Third Crusade. Number 13. The Knights Templar wore a white cloak with a red cross. This is very similar to the Knights in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yes, of course! The Holy Hand Grenade of Antioch! Number 14. In the game, the assassins use the phrase This translates from Arabic to English, meaning nothing is true, everything is permitted. The Assassin's Creed motto. This quote is said to be from the 11th century Persian missionary Hasai Sabah. Number 15. The book Alamut served as a primary inspiration for Assassin's Creed. The Alamut was written by Vladimir Bartol. Number 16. Altair was supposed to have a Middle Eastern accent, but at the last minute the director decided to give Altair an American accent. Number 17. Altair doesn't get a Middle Eastern accent until the fourth game in the franchise. Assassin's Creed Revelations. Number 18. Ubisoft included a crossbow originally in the first Assassin's Creed game, but a playtester used it primarily instead of his melee weapon, so Ubisoft decided to remove it. It can still be seen in the original trailer for the game. Number 19. The crossbow was also removed because of historical inaccuracies. The weapon didn't exist until 1480, over 300 years after Altair is born. Number 20. Another weapon the player can use is throwing knives, which ended up being the ranged replacement for the crossbow. Number 21. In order to create the environment of the game, art director Raphael Lacoste and his team invested a lot of time in researching historical documents, including maps from the era, illustrations, paintings, and travel logs. Number 22. Some say Altair can't swim because he grew up in a desert, but rumors are the reason why Altair can't swim is because of a bug in the Animus software, or at least that's what the developers put in the sequels. Number 23. Assassin's Creed debuted on Steam on April 9th, 2008. PC gamers either 
either waited a year to play the game or used Assassin's Creed as a good excuse to buy a PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360. In my opinion, they probably did both because you can never have too many gaming systems. Number 24. In 2007, a game-breaking bug was put into the game so that pirated versions would not be allowed to finish the game. Surprise, suckers! Piracy never pays. Number 25. Assassin's Creed 1 was pirated over 700,000 times and filed a suit against optical experts manufacturing for leaking a copy. Number 26. Francisco Randerez is the face model of Altair, Ezio, and Desmond Miles. This makes sense because they are all descendants of Altair. Number 27. Assassin's Creed was supposed to be a Prince of Persia game called Prince of Persia Assassin, but some of the Ubisoft people didn't like that the game wasn't actually about a prince, so they decided to rebrand the whole thing. Number 28. Ubisoft and game designer Hideo Kojima played an April Fool's prank on their fans by releasing a video showing a crossover between Kojima's Metal Gear and Assassin's Creed. That is a game we'd like to see. Number 29. Assassin's Creed and Metal Gear Solid both have Easter eggs that refer to one another. One is a cardboard box in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood that looks very much like the one in Metal Gear Solid. I mean, cardboard boxes have proven again and again that they are the best places to hide in any time period. Number 30. Nolan North is the voice actor for Desmond Miles. He is also the voice actor for Drake and the Uncharted series, as well as many other protagonists. I guess he has one of those voices made for the action role. Number 31. Though Altair and Desmond Miles are essentially the same person, they are not actually voiced by the same person. Altair is voiced by Philip Shabazz. He only worked on the first Assassin's Creed. Number 32. Kristen Bell is the voice actress for Lucy Stillman, who was actually designed after Bell. Kristen Bell is known for playing the TV character Veronica Mars and for voicing Anna in Disney's Frozen. Number 33. Up until its release, Ubisoft Montreal tried to keep the details of Assassin's Creed a mystery. On October 22, 2007, less than a month before the release, an email was sent out to fans with just a single bloody feather and the message to be ready. Number 34. Kristen Bell actually spilled the beans in late 2006 about part of the game's storyline. She said in an interview with IGN that it's about a science company trying to Matrix style go into people's brains and find out an ancestor who used to be an assassin. Yikes! Hope Ubisoft wasn't mad about that. Number 35. The name of the machine that allows Desmond to relive the memories of his ancestors is called the Animus. The Animus is kind of like if the Matrix and that thing they used in Inception to share dreams had a baby together. Number 36. Altair is missing his ring finger on his left hand. This is a self-inflicted wound to hide his blade that extends out of his forearm. Number 37. Altair is not only the name of the main character, but is also the name of a star as well. Fitting since he is the star of this game. Number 38. The name Altair in Arabic means flying one or bird of prey. His last name, Ibn La Ahad, means son of no one. Number 39. Altair's birthday is January 11th, 1165, and he was raised to be a master assassin after both of his parents died at a young age. Well, if Batman has told us anything, that if your parents die at a young age, I guess you have to just become a professional ass kicker. Number 40. At the beginning of Assassin's Creed, Altair is 26, the same age as Desmond Miles. The biggest difference between them is that Desmond Miles isn't nearly as successful as Altair, but at least Desmond still has his parents, or one of them. Number 41. Desmond Miles was a bartender before being captured, so being kidnapped was kind of a step up for him. He was promoted to assassin almost immediately. Number 42. The reason Altair lost his rank in the assassin organization is because he broke all three of the assassin's tenets. The rules to be an assassin are very similar to the rules of Fight Club, it appears. Number 43. Assassin's Creed was released with a major bug that caused Altair to freeze in midair. Number 44. In Assassin's Creed 1, some of the balconies are shaped like Optimus Prime from Transformers. It can be easily overlooked, but once you spot it, you'll never forget it's there. Number 45. Assassin's Creed doesn't kill the player. Instead, the main character loses synchronization upon death. This makes sense since the player is just playing another character in the simulation. Number 46. The Animus is still being perfected in Assassin's Creed 1. This is shown in the sequels by having the Animus referred to as different versions. Number 47. Hitman and Assassin's Creed have a lot more in common than just being both stealth games that involve killing primary targets. They also share a musical composer, Jesper Kidd. Jesper has worked on several titles, including the famous Borderlands franchise. Number 48. For the game music, Jesper used lots of somber choir songs and some medieval eastern instruments. Number 49. On the Assassin's Creed soundtrack, there are 11 songs that provide about 40 minutes of good assassinating music. Number 50. Assassin's Creed was first demoed at E3 2006. Other games that also debuted were Super Smash Bros. Brawl and Final Fantasy 13. Number 51. The game was in development for three years before it 
debuted at E3 2006. Number 52. Ubisoft built an entirely new engine for Assassin's Creed to have it run as best as possible on the PS3 and Xbox 360. Even though the game had its issues, the fact that they developed it for a next-gen console put Assassin's Creed at the front of the line for the gaming standard. Number 53. Assassin's Creed spawned several spin-offs and eventually became the most successful Ubisoft franchise, with over 73 million copies sold as of 2014. Number 54. The open world of Assassin's Creed has three detailed cities in it. Jerusalem, Agar, and Damascus. If you know some of those names, you either lived in the area or you went to church a lot when you were a kid. Thanks, Sunday School. Number 55. Assassin's Creed allows players to kill nearly all of the non-player characters. Another title that does this is the Grand Theft Auto series. Killing everyone is not needed or really recommended, but it is possible. Number 56. The director for Assassin's Creed was Patrice Desolets, and he did so good he was brought back to be the director of the sequel. Number 57. Assassin's Creed was written by Corey May and M. Duma Wenshu. They have worked on several titles together, including the popular series Prince of Persia. Number 58. Corey May wrote six out of the 13 of the Assassin's Creed games. Those five are Assassin's Creed, Assassin's Creed 2, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Assassin's Creed Revelations, Assassin's Creed 3, and Assassin's Creed 4, Black Flag. Number 59. The game and the film for Assassin's Creed do not follow the same storyline. The game follows the story of Desmond Miles, while the movie follows Callum Lynch. Number 60. The movie adaptation starring Michael Fassbender was released on December 21st, 2016. That's almost a decade between the Assassin's Creed game and the first movie. Number 61. The game was nominated for several awards and won Best Action Slash Adventure Game in the 2006 Game Critic Awards. Number 62. In Assassin's Creed, there are beggars that ask for money relentlessly. One of the ways to get rid of them is by putting away the blade that Altair has and using a fist. I mean, sounds horrible. I mean, it is horrible, but I mean, come on. They just, they're so relentless. Number 63. The reason why the player doesn't die in the game is because creative director Patrice Desolets wanted the player to not feel like they were in a game. Number 64. The, quote, memories in the game is another way of saying levels. By calling them memories, the player is able to keep the idea of living the game. Number 65. The developers originally only had a crowd of 35 people, but after four years of development, the crowd grew to an outstanding 120 NPCs. At least that was outstanding back in 2007. Most of them were relentless beggars. Number 66. The Assassin's Creed development team began with just 10 members who were fresh off the critically acclaimed Prince of Persia Sands of Time. Number 67. Once Assassin's Creed was greenlit for production, the team of 10 went to work immediately. They weren't sure what they could do yet since they didn't even have the development kits for the next generation consoles though. All the team had was a dream to make a game that was supposed to be a spin-off into a successful next generation launch title. Number 68. Assassin's Creed is known for its art. They created 250 keyframes of climbing animations in order to make Altair look much more natural when he scales buildings in the game. Number 69. In Assassin's Creed the player must collect flags. Unfortunately this does pretty much nothing for the player. Number 70. How useless are these flags you're asking? Well, they provide a save point and they can sort of help restore synchronization. If you collect all the flags in one area, you will get an extra synchronization bar unrelated to the main plot or memories. Eh, doesn't really sound worth the effort, but hey, it's there. Number 71. Getting more bars can help build endurance, though. The more memory synchronization bars you fill, the longer the synchronization bar becomes. It prolongs the player's life, so to speak. Number 72. Creative director Patrice Desolet gives the reasoning for the flags as being an act of rebellion. The flags are meant to show ownership, so Altair is taking them back and letting people know they are not owned. Number 73. Looks like Patrice took some of his own flags back. After the release of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Patrice Desolet announced that he was leaving Ubisoft Montreal to join THQ Montreal as their creative director. Number 74. Assassin's Creed 1 and 2 were both only released on the PS3, Xbox 360, and PC. There was originally a PS2 and an Xbox Assassin's Creed game planned that had an entirely different story, but it was cancelled by the publisher. Developers then concentrated on making Assassin's Creed into a next-gen game. Number 75. Assassin's Creed actually takes place in the year 2012. 
2012. At the time of the release, this was five years into the future, and it looks like they overshot technology almost as much as Back to the Future 2 did. Number 76. In the game, the company that is responsible for all of this mess is a corporate conglomerate known as Abstergo Industries, led by Warren Vidic. This is the company that kidnaps Desmond and tells him to trust them. So, yes, all of the elements of being the bad guy is there, and spoiler alert, they are the bad guys. Number 77. Warren Vidic kidnaps Desmond Miles in order to steal secrets that are stored in his genetic code. We're just gonna pretend like that's possible. Number 78. The Animus doesn't only put Desmond Miles into his ancestors' memories, but also renders the genetic memories into 3D landscapes. This helps Desmond process all that he needs to unlock the last mystery. Number 79. The reason why Desmond must go through each memory to retrieve the information that Warren Vidic wants is because he does not possess the confidence. Thanks to the nine missions of confidence building, Desmond will have the ability to retrieve his memories. Number 80. Assassin's Creed starts with Altair going on a mission to retrieve the Peace of Eden. The Peace of Eden is an ancient technology that has the power to control the thoughts of individuals. Number 81. The Peace of Eden is also known as an Apple of Eden. Unfortunately, this apple isn't under warranty and the rest of the pieces need to be found by hand. Number 82. Assassin's Creed is a stealth game even if it is a very forgiving one. Unlike other stealth games, if the player is seen, they can hide in haystacks around the city for a few moments until the guards forget about them. They can also sit on a bench next to a bunch of people, or get lost in the crowd, or hide on rooftops. Number 83. The player can even jump from high building tops and land safely in bales of hay. If only that was possible in real life, hay would be a lot more useful. Number 84. There are places on the map called viewpoints, which are at the tops of very high buildings. The viewpoints give a 360 camera rotation view and uncover previously obscure obscured objects on the map. Number 85, Al Mulim translates to teacher in English, and he is most likely modeled after a teacher named Rashad Adadin Sadin. Number 86, Rashid Adin Sinan was a real person who allegedly ordered two botched assassination attempts on Saladin, the ruler of Syria and Egypt at the time. Number 87, at a certain point Desmond is able to use Altair's ability called Eagle Vision. Eagle Vision gives the player the ability to see otherwise invisible signs and symbols at a glance, and they can also be used to see a person's intention towards them. Number 88. One of the benefits of using Altair's eagle vision is seeing writing in blood that reveals a secret. It's like a black light, but, you know, installed in your head. Number 89. Eagle vision allows for the players to see either a red outline for hostile characters, a blue outline for friendly characters, a gold outline for special characters, or a white outline for places and objects that can assist the player. Number 90. Eagle vision is not actually a real thing that Desmond experiences. It is described as a function of the Animus. It was made to simulate the extremely highly trained sense of observation an assassin possesses, but later on in the sequels, it was made so that the assassins have the ability to see into a sort of spirit world. Number 91. In order to use Eagle Vision, the player must be perfectly still and be in complete synchronization. This prevents the player from using it while being chased or attacked. Number 92. As mentioned, the game alternates between the two timelines and its respective characters through the use of memory blocks, but Desmond can't stay in the machine for too long, or else he will begin to hallucinate. And believe us, that's never a good sign. Number 93. These hallucinations are called the bleeding effect, and as a result, Desmond is forced to rest in between chapters to avoid them. This allows the player to explore the modern day world, which is pretty much just a clean lab. Number 94. Desmond often questions Vidic's motives, and the two have many philosophical debates. This relationship is similar to Altair and his master, Al Mulim. Number 95. A PSP exclusive version of the game was released on November November 17, 2009, entitled Assassin's Creed Bloodlines. This story picks up where the console left off, but the player only plays as Altair and not as Desmond. Number 96. A PC-only Director's Cut Edition was released a year after the original game, and it added a bunch of mission types that didn't make it into the final version of the original. Even though this was a year late, the added missions made it worth it. Number 97. There was a spin-off game for the DS. It was a prequel to Altair's story in the console version. The game received recognition from Hideo Kojima and the Metal Gear Solid team. Metal Gear Solid even added a special Assassin's Creed uniform for its game as a shout-out. Number 98. The game's timeline is about two months, going from July to September. It starts after the Crusader victory in the Siege of Acre and goes to just before the Battle of Arsif, but a dedicated gamer can get it down in just a few hours. Number 99. Pretty much all of the targets you kill in the game are people who actually existed in real life and who also died in that same year they die in the 
the game. Number 100. The Animus Machine is based on a theory by the philosopher Carl Jung called the Collective Unconscious Theory. Jung suggested the notion that certain thoughts or patterns could be shared between unconscious minds, and the words anima and animus represent various altered and emotional states. Number 101. The Assassin's Creed series has led to the creation of 10 novels. The English historian Anton Gill, who goes by the pen name Oliver Bowden, wrote eight of those 10 books. The last two were young adult novels by Matthew J. Kirby called Assassin's Creed Last Descendants. Number 102. The Assassin's Creed franchise is not set to stop anytime soon, but there is actually an ending already written for the series. Hopefully, none of the voice actors spoil it this time. Kristen. Number 103. Ubisoft has 29 total development teams in the country, and 10 of those work in Assassin's Creed. That's over a third of the company. Number 104. With the newest update, Assassin's Creed requires only 6.6 gigabytes of space to install on an Xbox 360 hard drive. Soon enough, we'll probably be able to play it on our phones. Number 105. On August 6, 2009, Assassin's Creed became available on the Xbox 360's Games On Demand service. It only cost $29.99 or 2,400 Microsoft points. Number 106. In 2011, a deal came out that offered a bundle package. After purchasing Assassin's Creed Revelations for PlayStation 3, the player would have a copy of the original Assassin's Creed on the disc 2. Now those discs are used as either collector's items or coasters. And finally, number 107. Unfortunately, Assassin's Creed got mixed reviews when it came out, including getting a 10 from GameSpot, but then getting a 4.5 from a reviewer at EGM, Electronic Gaming Monthly. What would you rate it? Comment below and let us know. What's that? You want another timeline? Well, then we've got a treat for you. Here is the timeline of Ezio Auditore, the first assassin we met all the way back in 2007. What a legend. Birth of the Assassin, June 24, 1459 to 1477. Ezio Auditore da Firenze is born on June 24, 1459 in Florence to Giovanni and Maria Auditore. The Auditores are a noble family, so Ezio's childhood and teenage years are pretty bougie. He apprentices under a banker and loves what all snobby rich boys love, ladies and alcohol. Ezio makes his first of many enemies, Vieri de Pazzi, the son of another Florentine noble family. Vieri is all over Cristina Vespucci, but Ezio fights him off and saves her. Ezio and Cristina develop feelings for one another, and Vieri's rage simmers, culminating at a fight on the Ponte Vecchio, where Vieri throws a stone and gives Ezio his infamous lip scar. Vieri flees, and Ezio celebrates by spending a scandalous night with Cristina, until her dad finds them. Once Ezio gets home, his father asks him to run a letter that happened to implicate Vieri's father in a murder. In December, Ezio meets his lifelong friend, Leonardo da Vinci. But after running a few more letter errands for his father, Ezio returns to find his home ransacked, and his father and two brothers missing. Since there's a warrant out for his arrest too, Ezio sneaks to Giovanni's prison window. Giovanni tells Ezio where to find a secret chest that contains assassin gear. Ezio finds it and suits up for the first time. Giovanni also instructs Ezio to take a letter detailing a plot against Florence and the Auditores to Alberto Alberte, the Gonfalonier, and a supposed family friend. Except now he's acting sketchy. The next day, Uberto denies ever getting this letter as he presides over the execution of Ezio's father and two brothers. Ezio nearly gets himself killed by trying to kill Uberto on the spot, but he flees to a brothel run by friends of his family. That night, Ezio and Cristina go to recover the bodies so they can be given proper last rites, since the government was planning on just dumping them in the river. Cristina refuses to run away with Ezio, so they kiss and part ways. Ezio wastes no time. He gets Leonardo to repair Giovanni's broken hidden blade, then promptly assassinates Uberto in front of tons of people. He reclaims his documents, too. Ezio flees with his mother and sister to his uncle Mario's villa in Monte Regioni. Vieri and his goons are waiting for them, but Mario chases them off. Uncle Mario tells Ezio the secret Auditore family history. They're all assassins. Turns out the Pazzis are part of the Templar Order, the assassin's longtime enemy, and they ordered a hit on Ezio's family. Mario trains Ezio in the assassin arts for one year, and after some hesitation, Ezio accepts his place in the assassin brotherhood. Going after the Pazzis, 1478. Ezio joins Mario just in time to kill Vieri de Pazzi in a duel. Killing Vieri also frees up the villa from continual harassment. From here, Ezio vows to track 
and kill every Templar responsible for his family's death, in particular Rodrigo Borgia, the Grand Master of the Templar Order in Italy. Mario shows Ezio the villa's codex wall, and Ezio vows to continue his father's work to decode the codex of the legendary assassin mentor Altair ibn La Ahad, which contains the location of a mysterious vault. Oh, and he ropes in his pal Leonardo to help build him fancy new assassin gadgets. When Ezio returns to Florence, he learns of the Pazzi's plan to assassinate the heads of the Medici family, the de facto leaders of Florence, as well as auditory allies. With the Medici's gone, the Pazzi would place their own man, Borgia, in charge of Florence. Ezio isn't able to save Giuliano de' Medici, but he does manage to protect Lorenzo. As the city's on the cusp of civil war, Ezio kills Francesco de' Pazzi and forces the rest of the Pazzi gang to flee. He begins to regularly get contracts from Lorenzo. For the next few years, Ezio continues to hunt down the Pazzi's and Borgia. This climax is in 1480, when Borgia kills the last Pazzi, and very nearly kills an eavesdropping Ezio, too, going after the Barbarigos. 1480 to 1486. Ezio heads to Venice to hunt down Borgia's Templar associate, Emilio Barbarigo, a corrupt, tyrannical merchant. With the help of some local thieves, Ezio kills Emilio in his own palace. He gets a lead to another Templar meeting, attended by Borgia himself, and learns of the Templar's plan to poison the Doge and replace him with Emilio's cousin, Marco. Ezio and his allies use Leonardo's new flying machine to get into the Doge's palace, but Ezio arrives too late and gets framed for the Doge's murder. Marco becomes the Doge, but Ezio is quickly able to infiltrate his Carnivale party and kill him before he can do any real damage. The one nice Barbarigo then becomes Doge. He asks Ezio and company to kill the other Barbarigo, Silvio, since Silvio's planning on killing him. Ezio does, but discovers that the assassination plot was a decoy so that the Templars could flee to Cyprus. Securing the Apple, formal induction, June 24th, 1488. Two years later, the Templar ship comes back, bearing the Apple of Eden, a powerful artifact. Ezio snags it and finally confronts Borgia, who, after claiming he's the prophet, escapes after a beating from Ezio and his assassin pals. Uncle Mario and the assassins take this opportunity to tell Ezio that they believe he's the fabled prophet who will open the vault, and so they formally induct him into the assassin order. The Battle of Forli, late summer 1488. The assassins decide to keep the apple with Katerina Sforza, lord of Forli and an assassin ally. However, Templar mercenaries intercept the party. During the ensuing Battle of Forli, a nine-fingered monk named Girolamo Savonarola snags the apple for himself. While searching for Savonarola and the apple, Ezio agrees to take a job protecting Christopher Columbus from an assassination plot twice. And he wasn't even asked to the second time. But before this second, or valiant, rescue, Ezio decides to postpone searching for the apple and heads to Spain to save some assassins from the Templar-backed Spanish Inquisition. In the process, he kills a ton of inquisitors, frees the king of the Moors, and brings an end to the war. He also also learns that Borgia is a papal candidate. Savonarola rises, 1494 to 1496. After his little vacation, Ezio returns to Italy and his actual quest of looking for the apple. Unfortunately, his chase hits a dead end in Florence in 1494. And when he gets back to Venice, he gets even worse news. His ally, Lorenzo de' Medici, is dead, and Borgia is now the new pope. Alexander VI. Plus, Savonarola has used Medici's death to his advantage and taken control over Florence. Savonarola is preaching for a return to the Middle Ages and ordering people to burn all the writing and artworks of the Renaissance. Bonfire of the Vanities, 1497 to 1498. Ezio heads back to Florence and sets to work assassinating Savonarola's nine lieutenants, who had been suppressing the citizens. His old flame Christina dies in the chaos, but the second the lieutenants are gone, the citizens of Florence rise up and drive Savonarola out of his house. House. Even the apple can't save him. So Ezio finally recovers the apple and kills Savonarola. Hey, it's a better way to go than being burnt to death by an angry mob. Into the vault, 1499. Now armed with the apple and a complete codex, the assassins learn that the fabled vault is beneath the Vatican. They also learn that the papal staff Borgia possesses is another piece of Eden, which can open the vault when used with the apple. After a fierce piece of Eden wielding duel, Ezio bests Borgia, but refuses to kill him. That won't bring his family back. Instead, Ezio proves he's the prophet by entering the vault. Inside, he finds only a holographic figure named Minerva, who claims to be a member of a first civilization who made humans. She also warns about the reoccurrence of a great catastrophe, and addresses some guy named Desmond, whoever that is. It's a whole thing we don't have time to get into. Just go check out our complete Assassin's Creed timeline if you want the whole story, because that also exists.
exists. When he exits the vault, Ezio discovers that Borgia is gone and the staff has sunken into the floor. He contemplates casting the apple into the Tiber River, but decides to hand it over to Uncle Mario, and the two ride back to the family villa. Siege of Monte Regioni, January 2nd, 1500. Shortly after their return, Cesare Borgia, Rodrigo's son, lays siege on Monte Regioni with the papal army. His army destroys the city, and Cesare himself steals the apple and kills Mario. Ezio attempts to pursue Cesare to Rome, but passes out from his own severe injuries. Liberation of Rome, 1500 to 1503. Fellow assassin, Nicolai Machiavelli, brings Ezio to Rome and explains that Borgia's ascent to power has brought Rome into a state of serious disrepair. The city is in ruins, people are pressed and starving. Soon after burning his first Borgia tower, Ezio meets Nicholas Copernicus, a scholar whose teachings are so radically anti-Templar that Vatican guards are trying to kill him. Ezio ends up following the breadcrumbs and killing the Pope's master of the sacred palace, who's been tasked with making sure Rome's philosophy stayed pure. Ezio then starts strengthening the assassin order, dwindling Borgia's influence at the same time. He revitalizes the assassin's relationships with the courtesans, the thieves, and the mercenaries. By 1501, he starts rebuilding the assassin order by recruiting new apprentices, including his sister, Claudia. From here, Ezio burns down the rest of Borgia's towers in Rome and kills a ton of Templar agents and two of Cesare's three generals. After he snags the key to Castel San Angelo from an amorous actor, he's appointed mentor of the Italian assassins. But he doesn't have time for any ceremony. He immediately heads out to kill Rodrigo Borgia, but his work is already done. Cesare has just murdered his father. But to be fair, he was trying to poison him. Ezio beats Cesare to the apple's hiding spot, and in December 1503, the assassins wipe out the rest of Cesare's loyalists. The new pope orders Cesare's arrest, and the Borgia's rule of Rome is officially done. Cesare imprisoned, 1504 to 1506. Cesare is exiled to Spain and imprisoned. His whereabouts are a secret even to Ezio, who is now a counselor to the pope. Despite all the precautions, Cesare escapes after two years and takes shelter with his brother-in-law, King John III of Navarre. The king then gives Cesare full control of the Navarre's army. Meanwhile, in 1506, Ezio seals the apple away in the Colosseum vault. After following some Borgia lovers who had kidnapped Claudia, Ezio is already on Cesare's trail by the time he escapes. Siege of Viana, March 1507. King John has Cesare lead a force of 10,000 soldiers to seize the town of Viana, and Cesare is hoping that this can eventually help him recapture Rome. Ezio finds Cesare in the midst of a brutal siege and nearly kills him, but Cesare escapes again. Surrounded by scenes of the Navarre's army killing civilians, Ezio finds Cesare once more as his forces encroach upon the castle and kills him for good by throwing him off a wall. Good job. With their commander gone, the Navarre's quickly lose the battle, and the Borgia tyranny is finally over. Ezio returns to Rome and continues to reform and improve the assassin order. Arrival in Masiaf, March 1511. Two years after Cesare's death, Ezio finds an interesting letter among Uncle Mario's belongings. The letter is from his father and mentions a a sealed library beneath the fortress of Masia, which belonged to Altair. Curiosity leads Ezio to leave Italy in 1510, and he arrives in Masia the following March, and is immediately ambushed by Templars. Ezio escapes, only to learn that special keys are needed to unlock the special library, and the Templar captain, Leondros, has the journal containing their whereabouts. He figures they're looking for the keys too, so naturally, Ezio assassinates him, claims the journal, and heads to where the keys are, Constantinople. Arrival in Constantinople, May 1511. In Constantinople, Ezio quickly makes new friends and helps retake some assassin dens from the Templars. He recovers his first key beneath a bookstore run by his future wife, Sophia Sartor. She helps Ezio decode a map leading to more keys. Ezio also manages to save an Ottoman prince, Suleiman, from an assassination plot by the remnants of Byzantine forces. Ezio agrees to help hunt down those responsible in between key hunting. With each new key he recovers, Ezio is able to live through significant moments of Altair's life. Conflict with Prince Ahmet, 1512. Ezio suspects that one of the captains, Tariq, was behind the botched assassination. This guy also has ties to the former Byzantine heir, Manuel Paleogos. So Su Lemon has Ezio assassinate Tariq. Just as Ezio fatally wounds him, Tariq admits he was actually a spy plotting to ambush Manuel. He was just trying to get in his good graces. So Ezio follows up on Tariq's mission, follows Manuel to Cappadocia, and assassinates him. Manuel also happens to have the final key. Ezio finally has all the keys, but turns out that Su Lemon's uncle, Prince Ahmed, 
Amit is the leader of the Byzantine Templars. Amit threatens to harm Sophia Sartor if Ezio doesn't hand over the key, but Ezio refuses and tries to beat Amit back to Constantinople. Fight for the Masyaf Keys, 1512. Ezio returns to find Sophia's bookshop ransacked and his closest assassin allies slaughtered. To save Sophia, Ezio has no choice but to hand the keys over to Amit. But it's a trick. Sophia is about to be killed elsewhere anyway. However, Ezio saves her and pursues Amit's carriage. Just as he wrecks the carriage, Amit's brother and Suleiman's father, Selim, appear with a platoon of Ottoman guards. Selim and Amit's father had just chosen Selim as the new sultan, so Selim proceeds to throw Amit off a cliff. But it's not all bad. Selim spares Ezio because he's heard such good things from his son, but orders him to not return to Constantinople. Retirement and death. 1512 to November 30th, 1524. Ezio and Sophia travel to Masyaf, where Ezio can now successfully open the library with his five keys. Inside, he finds no books, but an apple and the remains of Altair, with one last memory seal detailing the final moments of his life. Ezio rejects the temptation to touch the apple, yet the apple activates, and Ezio is able to directly address this Desmond that he's heard about all those years ago. Ezio lays down his arms as a sign of retirement and says he's merely a conduit for a message he doesn't understand. Ezio and Sophia then travel to Italy and marry. Ezio and Sophia retire to a villa in the Tuscan countryside. They have their first child, Flavia, in 1513, and their son, Marcello, the following year. In 1519, Ezio gets a serious chest infection, which leaves him with a cough for the rest of his life. Still, that doesn't stop him from briefly coming out of retirement. In 1524, a Chinese assassin named Xiao Jun seeks him out at his villa, asking for his advice on how to rebuild the Chinese assassin order. Ezio initially refuses, but eventually agrees to help out. Chinese imperial soldiers ambush the pair in Florence, and Ezio trains Xiao Jun in preparation for the next ambush on his villa. The pair successfully defend Ezio's home, and Xiao Jun goes on her way as a fully formed assassin. Finally, Ezio accompanies Sophia and Flavia on a trip to Florence, and while while his wife and daughter go shopping, he passes away on a park bench. Wow, after everything he did, Ezio deserved to go in peace. The Assassin's Creed train has kept on rolling without him, but he'll still go down as one of the greatest assassins of all time. Which Ezio game is your favorite? I think Assassin's Creed 2 is just a classic. That's my opinion. We're not just gonna talk about one assassin though. No, we've got a video that highlights every assassin in Assassin's Creed in 12 minutes. Sorry we couldn't condense it down to 11. Altair ibn Lahad. Altair is playable in most games. Raised to be an assassin by his assassin parents, Altair becomes a master assassin at the ridiculously young age of 24. After he defeats Al Mualim, he becomes the new mentor of the order. Altair is the first assassin to perform comprehensive studies of an Apple of Eden and dramatically reforms the way the assassin order does business. He makes them more secretive, stops the horrible initiation tradition of slicing off one's finger, allows the use of poison, and even redesigns the hidden blade. From there, Altair travels the globe to establish many assassin guilds. Before he dies, Altair amasses a massive library of knowledge, much of which is condensed into his codex. Ezio Auditore da Firenze. The games he's in are the Ezio trilogy, of course. After his father and brothers are hanged by a Templar plot, Ezio begins his journey from a young entitled nobleman to a master assassin. Alongside his quest for vengeance, Ezio reunites Altair's codex with the help of his best buddy, Leonardo da Vinci. Turns out that Ezio is the fabled prophet, fated to open the Vatican's vault. He becomes mentor of the Italian Brotherhood, which he reforms and expands. Over his career, Ezio liberates a bunch of republics from Templar rule, including Rome, Florence, and the Byzantine Empire. His final official act in the order is to unlock Altair's fabled library in Masyaf. After he retires, Ezio helps a Chinese assassin named Xiao Jun before passing away peacefully. Radon Hagedong, aka Connor Kenway. He's playable in Assassin's Creed III and Liberation. This assassin is born and raised in Kanata Seitong, a Native American village which guards the First Temple. After George Washington and a bunch of Templars attack the village, Radon Agedong takes the name of Connor and joins the Brotherhood, even though they had essentially been wiped out by the Templars. Connor wipes out the Templars in return and rebuilds the assassins as a master assassin. Eventually, he becomes close to Washington, who he doesn't initially realize destroyed his village. At the Battle of Chesapeake Bay, Connor kills the Grand Master, who happens to be his father, and secures the safety of the Grand Temple by hiding away the key. Oh, and for what it's worth, in an alternate timeline, he kills a Mad King version of George Washington, corrupted by the Apple of Eden. Haytham Kenway even though his father Edward was an assassin, Haytham joins the Templars after Edward gets assassinated during his childhood. 
The British Templars send Haytham to America to find the Grand Temple. He locates it, but he's unable to enter, so he stays in the New World, founds the American Rite of the Templar Order, and makes himself Grand Master. The Templars become super powerful under his rule, utterly infiltrating the American government and exterminating all the assassins except for one. Haytham attempts to stir support for the American Revolution in order to create an independent Templar-run country. Desmond Miles Through his two assassin parents, Desmond is related to every assassin we've mentioned so far on this list. As a result, his genes are ridiculously valuable to both the Assassin Order and the Templars. Using a device called the Animus, both organizations want Desmond to relive the memories of his ancestors so they can locate several pieces of Eden. At first, the Templars are holding him prisoner, but the modern-day assassins break him out so he can help them. After he helps find the Grand Temple, Desmond opens it and sacrifices himself to stop the second solar flare and prevent the end of the world. Too bad canceling the apocalypse also releases Juno, a humanity-hating Isu supremacist that Minerva imprisoned long ago. Aveline de Grand Prix Aveline is playable in Assassin's Creed III Liberation. Well, she's the first woman on this list for one thing. She's the daughter of an African slave and a wealthy French merchant. Despite her comfortable lifestyle, Aveline joins the assassins at an early age to combat the oppression of slavery. To that end, Aveline single-handedly rids New Orleans of its Templar-run slave trafficking trade, which also just frees a work camp at Chichen Itza in the process. Unfortunately, the master Templar she has to kill turns out to be her stepmother. Edward James Kenway. He's playable in Assassin's Creed IV Black Flag. Before he ever meets the assassins, Edward is a pirate. At first, he works with the Templars to find a first civilization site called the Observatory. He occasionally crosses paths with the assassins around the West Indies over the years, but ultimately, Edward's only loyal to his wallet. Once he realizes all the destruction his ambition has caused, Edward officially joins the Order and, eventually, secures the Observatory in the name of the Brotherhood. He then moves to London and becomes Grand Master of the British Brotherhood of Assassins. During this time, he conducts important research on the first civilization, research so important that the Templars eventually murder him in front of his child, Haytham, because of it. Aduale He's only playable in Freedom Cry, but he has a key role in Assassin's Creed IV and Rogue. Adewale is also a pirate, but he's more noble than Edward Kenway. Adewale was born a slave in Trinidad and joins the pirates who raid his plantation. This path eventually leads him to join forces with Edward Kenway as his quartermaster. Adewale encourages Edward to help the assassins, but when Edward doesn't budge, he abandons the captain to join the Brotherhood on his own. Adewale thereafter captains his own ship and becomes an assassin legend, freeing many slaves in the process. He also aids the Maroon Rebellion. Unfortunately, he meets his end at the hands of Shea Patrick Cormick when the Templars purge the assassins from the colonies. Shea Patrick Cormick. He's playable in Assassin's Creed Rogue. Shea joins the assassins at an early age. Eventually, he recovers two pieces of Eden that had been stolen by the Templars. The pieces of Eden point the assassins towards a first civilization temple in Lisbon, so Shea heads there to recover its artifact. Unfortunately, the recovery attempt triggers a catastrophic earthquake that kills thousands of innocent people. When Shea returns, he's furious, so he tries to steal the artifact. But when the assassins catch him, Shea gets shot and left for dead. Deeply disillusioned, Shea defects and is inducted into the Templar Order under Haytham. He then greatly helps the Brits win the Seven Year War and is instrumental in wiping out the colonial assassins. Shea kills several famous assassins, like Adewale and Charles Dorian, and dedicates a chunk of his life to hunting down artifacts for the Templars. Arno Dorian his game is Assassin's Creed Unity. He also makes a cameo in Rogue since, you know, Shay kills his father. After Arno's assassin father Charles is murdered, the Templar Grandmaster Francois de la Serre takes him under his wing. Then Arno gets wrapped up in a Templar coup and is framed for murdering Francois. While serving time in the Bastille, Arno decides to join the assassins and hunt down this radical new wing of the Templars alongside his lover slash adoptive sister, Elise. They trace the coup to the new Grand Master, who had been manipulating discontent with the aristocracy during the French Revolution. Obviously, Arno kills the Grand Master. Afterwards, Arno keeps a piece of Eden out of Napoleon's hands and eventually rises to the rank of Master Assassin. To honor Elise's wishes, he tries to cultivate peace between assassins and Templars. For a few years, anyway. Eventually, Arno saves Napoleon from a royalist assassination before hunting and assassinating the one responsible. Xiao Jun. She's playable in Assassin's Creed Chronicles China. She also makes an appearance in the short film Embers and, like, sorta possesses Anastasia in Assassin's Creed Chronicles Russia. Xiao Jun is a talented spy rescued by the Brotherhood from life as an imperial concubine. Only she and her mentor survive a purge of the assassins by the Templar-friendly Emperor, forcing them to flee west. Xiao Jun starts training under Ezio, and her training pays off. When she gets back to China, she eliminates the Templar faction, stops a Mongolian invasion, and rebuilds the Chinese Brotherhood as mentor. As an elder assassin, she comes up with the successful plan to finally poison the cruel Zha Jing Emperor. Arbaz Mir. His game is Assassin's Creed Chronicles India. Arbaz's career as an assassin revolves around an ultra-powerful piece of Eden, the Kohinoor. 
Basically, Arbaz becomes a master assassin by retrieving and or protecting the Koinor from British Templars on multiple occasions. He also marries a princess, and turns out to be a pretty bad father. Nikolai Orlov. He's playable in Assassin's Creed Chronicles Russia. Okay, Nikolai has had it rough. He has a few high-profile disasters under his belt. He fails to assassinate the Tsar, which causes the Borky train disaster, and he fails to retrieve a Staff of Eden before Templar Nikola Tesla could use it to blow things up. At least that last incident gave him a sort of sound vision. He does save Princess Anastasia and a precursor box from the Bolsheviks' extermination of the royal family. Except the princess starts to think she's Xiao Jun. Assassin scientists want to experiment on Anastasia in the hopes of extracting Xiao Jun's memories, even if she's harmed in the process. Nikolai then betrays the Brotherhood, saves Anastasia, and escapes to America. He has a son, but eventually the Brotherhood catches up to Nikolai and takes him down. Jacob Fry. He's playable in Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Ever since Jacob was six, his father raised him to be an assassin along with his twin sister, Evie. The twins moved to London at a time when the Templars had wiped out every assassin in the city, save for one. Jacob starts a gang, the Rooks, to weaken the Templar-backed blighters. After weakening the Templars with all kinds of fun stuff like street fights, Jacob and Evie eventually kill the Grand Master. They're then knighted by Queen Victoria. Jacob becomes mentor to the British assassins and rebuilds assassin influence and personnel in London. He also trains Jack the Ripper and has to deal with him when he, you know, starts killing innocent people. Evie Fry. She's also playable in Assassin's Creed Syndicate. As Jacob's twin sister, Evie has a similar childhood. Raised as an assassin, moves to London, you know the story. But instead of murdering tons of Templars in street battles like her brother, Evie sticks closer to the tenets of the Creed. She's more focused on recovering pieces of Eden, particularly the Shroud of Eden. She gets her hands on the Shroud after she and her brother assassinate the Grand Master. And yes, Evie also gets knighted. Afterwards, she moves to India and, as a master assassin, hangs out with the Indian Brotherhood, but comes back to London to help Jacob clean up that whole Jack the Ripper mess that he created. Bayek. His game is Assassin's Creed Origins. When Bayek's father was killed, he inherited his post as Magi, a member of an elite force that protects the Pharaoh's interest and the Egyptian people. After Bayek's son is murdered by the Order of the Ancients, basically proto-Templars, he and his wife Aya systematically go after their members, assassinating them one by one. Bayek becomes Cleopatra's personal Magi until she aligns herself with the Order at the end of the Alexandrine Civil War. He and Aya then found an organization called the Hidden Ones to retaliate against the Order and defend free will. The Hidden Ones and its tenets eventually evolve into the Assassin Brotherhood and the Creed. Bayek works to recruit members and expands the Hidden Ones to several cities. Aya, aka Amunet. She's in Assassin's Creed Origins. Like her husband, Aya's number one goal was to completely destroy the Order of the Ancients to avenge the death of her son. She acted as Cleopatra's right-hand woman to help the young queen ascend the Egyptian throne. But once Cleopatra got chummy with Julius Caesar and joined the Order, Aya split off with Bayek to form the Hidden Ones. From there, she went on to make history, stabbing Julius Caesar herself and years later convincing Cleopatra to take her own life by drinking poison. Aya technically didn't kill Cleopatra herself, but she's still known as Amunet, the legendary assassin who killed Cleopatra with an asp. Cassandra. She's playable in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Before she's even born, Cassandra has an amazing ancient Greek pedigree. She's the daughter of Pythagoras and the granddaughter of King Leonidas. Since Grandpa Leonidas was a human Isu hybrid, that makes her part Isu too. She even wields his old Isu made spear. Cassandra grows up to be a Mystheos and valiantly attempts to save her half brother Alexios from the Cult of Cosmos. Cassandra grows up to destroy the power hungry Cult of Cosmos, seal away the city of Atlantis, and then works against the Order of the Ancients. Eventually, she gets her hands on the staff of Hermes Trismegistus, becoming immortal and living all the way until 2018. She finally dies when she passes the staff along to her ancestor, Layla Hassan, urging her to destroy the pieces of Eden as her last request. So, that's the entire Assassin's Creed roster so far, but it's only gonna get bigger when Assassin's Creed Ragnarok comes out. Now that we've explained each assassin through Odyssey, why not dive a little deeper? There are so many connections between the characters throughout the series. So, here's the Assassin's Creed family tree explained. Distaff side, Altair. Umar ibn La Ahad. After failing to intimidate the Sultan of Egypt, Assassin Umar willingly gave himself up to Saracen forces for beheading. His last request was that the current mentor of the assassins, Al Mualim, personally trains his 11-year-old son, Altair, to become an assassin. Maud. Umar's wife Maud was a Christian member of the Levantine Brotherhood of Assassins during the Crusades. She died giving birth to Altair in 1165. Altair ibn La'ahad. 
A member of the Levantine Brotherhood of Assassins, Altair becomes the youngest master assassin at age 24. From a very early age, he had eagle vision, a sixth sense passed on from the Isu. After Desmond relived Altair's memories for a week inside the Animus, he gained eagle vision as well. During a mission to retrieve the Apple of Eden, a powerful Isu artifact, from the Temple of Solomon, Altair broke all three tenets of the Assassin's Creed, never kill an innocent, hide in plain sight, and never compromise the Brotherhood. To punish him, Al-Mualim stabbed him in a ritual execution. But in reality, Altair's skills were too valuable to the Order to be thrown away. So Al-Mualim demoted him to the lowest rank and sent him on a redemptive mission to kill nine Templars, supposedly in order to stop a third crusade. Altair discovered Al-Mualim's plot to conquer the world using the Apple of Eden and put an end to his treachery. And so Altair became the Order's new mentor and began writing the Codex, a personal journal slash compilation of assassin secrets soon after. A month after killing Al Mualim, Altair crossed paths with Crusader Maria Thorpe, an English Templar whose life he had previously spared after defeating her in combat. She and Altair infiltrated the Templar archives and confronted Grandmaster Bukhart. Altair killed him in combat. From there, he spread the word of the Brotherhood far and wide, using the Apple of Eden to gain hidden knowledge and create new and better weapons for the assassins. Meanwhile, Maria decided to officially retire from the Templars and settle down with Altair. Those two eventually got married and had two sons, Darum and Seth. In 12 17, they even had a fun family trip, traveling to Mongolia to assassinate Genghis Khan. Seth stayed behind to take care of his wife and daughters. When they returned, they discovered Seth had been murdered in his bed. Abbas Sofian, a fellow assassin, tried to take over the order. He imprisoned the acting leader of the assassins and ordered his lackey, Swami, to stab Seth to death. Altair eventually got his revenge on Swami, but at a price. Maria had warned him not to act out of vengeance, but for the good of the order. But Altair was overcome with rage. He used the Apple of Eden to force Swami to attack himself. To stop this, Maria tried to intervene and was killed by a frenzied Swami. And to make things worse, Abbas convinced all of the assassins that Altair was a vengeful murderer, unfit to lead the order. Altair retreated into exile and fell into a deep depression and driving his remaining family away. Several years later, he began using the apple again, discovering a first civilization temple hidden beneath Alamut Fortress. Within the temple, he found the memory seals, Isu artifacts capable of recording memories. He took five of them, recording important memories and later making them keys to his library. In 1247, he returned to the assassin headquarters in Masya to regain rule of the crumbling order, which had degenerated to cruelty under Abbas. Once he became mentor again, Altair spent the next decade building his library under Masia Fortress. Once it was completed, he invited explorers Niccolo and Maffeo Polo to join him, wanting to spread the order and its knowledge to other parts of the world. In 1257, as the Mongols invaded, Altair gave the Polos five of his seals and the codex to smuggle away and hide. Returning to the library, he locked himself inside, hid the apple, and after imprinting a final memory on the sixth seal, died peacefully at the age of 92. From there, Altair Altair's grandchildren would carry his assassin bloodline all the way down to Desmond on his mother's side. None of those folks did anything important, so now let's just move on to Desmond's Italian heritage. Auditore line. Domenico Auditore. In 1296, Domenico Auditore was inducted into the Assassin Order with Dante Alighieri, yes, the author of the Divine Comedy, as his mentor. Domenico's father tasked him with guarding Altair's Codex, but when attacked by Templars en route to Spain, Domenico broke its spine and separated its pages, spreading them among the ship's cargo to keep the whole thing out of Templar hands. He settled in Florence and adopted the name of Auditore, a minor nobleman, as cover. Guiding construction of Villa Auditore, including the Auditore family crypt, he constructed a sanctuary to protect the arm of Altair and hid Altair's six assassin seals in tombs throughout Italy. Renato Auditore in 1355, Domenico's son, Renato, hid the Shroud of Eden beneath Villa Auditore. He also protected it with traps, destroyed official records, and told the church the Shroud was a forgery. The only clues he left were cryptic notes, which his grandson Mario used to discover the Shroud. Giovanni Auditore da Firenze at request of his brother Mario, Giovanni brought the Shroud of Eden out of the city, bringing it under the Order's protection. Giovanni also saved a young Lorenzo de' Medici from drowning. Lorenzo later became a close friend and patron, and tracked but didn't kill Italian Templar Grandmaster Rodrigo Borgia, ultimately meeting him in Rome where Giovanni was attacked and wounded. Back home, he started a rivalry with the Pazzi family after getting Francisco de Pazzi arrested for murder. This rivalry led to Giovanni's execution, and his surviving family members, including his son Ezio, get exiled to Monteregioni to live with his brother. Mario Auditore. 
The ruler of Monteregione, Mario, helped Giovanni gather pages of Altair's codex and recovered the Shroud of Eden from the city's main well. In 1476, he saved his nephew Ezio from ambush by Vieri de Pazzi and trained him as an assassin. He saved Ezio again in 1488 when Mario fought Rodrigo Borgia and his men for the Apple of Eden. In 1499, he caused distractions all over Rome so Ezio could enter the Vatican vault. After that, Mario took the Apple of Eden back to Monteregione to guard it for Ezio. The next year, Rodrigo's son, Cesar, led an assault on Monteregioni, killing Mario and taking the apple. Ezio Auditore da Firenze. After his father was executed in 1476, 17-year-old Ezio learned about his family's assassin history and began training under his uncle Mario. The assassins already had six codex pages, but by age 29, Ezio found and united all 30 pages. With Leonardo da Vinci's help, of course, he deciphered its prediction. A prophet would bring together two pieces of Eden and open the vault and reveal a map of other vault locations. Borgia believed that he was the prophet and ruthlessly pursued the vault. And so, Ezio set out to stop Rodrigo Borgia from getting the map. Ezio caught up with Borgia Borgia, but Borgia escaped with the papal staff, a piece of Eden. At least he left behind an apple of Eden for Ezio to claim. Turns out that Ezio was the true prophet, so his allies formally inducted him into the Brotherhood of Assassins. In 1499, Ezio tracked down and eventually defeated Rodrigo Borgia, who at this point is the Pope, in a fistfight. With Borgia stopped, Ezio entered the vault and encountered an Isu named Minerva. Using Ezio's memories, she warned Desmond about future events of destruction and told him to find the other vaults. Once Ezio left the vault, he did some serious work for the assassins. He expanded the Brotherhood by recruiting oppressed Romans, used the apple to crush the remaining Borgia rule, and eventually became the mentor of the order. In 1506, Ezio found the Temple of Pythagoras and provided the coordinates to the Grand Temple to Desmond. Ezio also hid his apple in the lair of Romulus in the Basilica di Santa Maria in Araccioli to prevent the cult of Hermes from getting it. It remained there until 2012, when Desmond and co. found it. When Ezio learned about Altair's library, he searched Constantinople for the library's keys, each of which unlocked one of Altair's memories. During his search, he met and started to fall in love with a woman named Sophia Sartor. After finding the last key, Ezio learned that his and Altair's apples aren't the same. Choosing not to take Altair's apple for himself, Ezio used it to speak directly to Desmond. Ezio noted he's just a conduit for messages he doesn't understand and asked Desmond to continue the mission that Ezio was only ever a small part of. Ezio took off his blades and gear, renouncing his life as an assassin. He and Sophia returned to Constantinople and placed the keys in the Basilica Cistern under Sophia's former bookstore for protection. The two returned to Rome, got married, and had a daughter together. That covers Desmond's Italian assassin ancestors. Now let's talk about the English side of his lineage, the Kenways. Kenway line. Edward Kenway. The privateer turned pirate turned assassin, Edward Kenway, wore a lot of different hats. He had a slew of his own adventures that led him to discover the Crystal Skull and the Observatory. After a life of piracy left him bereft, he joined the assassins and eventually the rank of Master Assassin. In 1725, he and his wife Tessa had a son, Haytham. When Haytham was six, Edward started training him in swordsmanship and combat. Meanwhile, Edward used his business as a cover to find other first civilization temples. As he discovered clues about the Grand Temple, he wrote them down in his journal. In 35, Edward is killed by two intruders trying to steal his journal. Haytham E. Kenway. Following the murder of his father, Edward, in 1735, Haytham was turned to the Templars by the man who was secretly responsible for his father's murder, Reginald Birch. In 1754, Haytham obtained the Grand Temple key by killing the assassin possessing it. Haytham then traveled to the colonies in search for the first civilization's storehouse and established a permanent Templar base, the Colonial Rite. As part of assembling his team and finding the storehouse, Haytham freed Native American slaves held at Southgate Fort, including a woman who appeared to speak English. Tracking her down, he and the woman, guys a Zio, who I'm going to shorten to Zio, plotted to kill Braddock and his men. He and Zio located the storehouse, but Haytham couldn't open it with his temple key. Along the way, he unknowingly fathered a son with Zio. His adventures continued. He killed pirate and assassin legend Adewale with the help of former assassin Shay and dueled but didn't kill Achilles. Over the next three years, he destroyed the colonial brotherhood, leaving Templars in control of the colonies. Haytham also managed to incite riots against the British in 1770, pinning blame on Connor Kenway. In 1774, he learned of Zio's death and existence of Connor, though it wasn't until he spotted Connor up close that he knew he was his son. In 1778, he and Connor 
Hunter reached a truce to find Templar Benjamin Church, who they track and kill in the Caribbean. Haytham informs Connor of Washington's plans to attack his home village and tells him Washington was responsible for his mother's death, causing Connor to break off their alliance. Haytham sends away co-conspirator Charles Lee to continue the Templar's work. In a final confrontation at Fort George, Haytham is killed by Connor. Zio, great, great, great grandmother. Zio was a member of the Ganya Gahaga tribe and daughter and heir of the clan mother. She also held an Eden fragment. Her village, Ganasegan, guarded the entrance to the Grand Temple. To keep this secret, her people remained neutral in conflicts, but with colonial attacks, Zio wanted to actively fight the British. To this, she befriends Achilles Davenport. 1754, she was captured by slaver Silas Thatcher and freed by Haytham Kenway. She met and allied with Haytham Kenway to kill British Army General Edward Bulldog Braddock, eventually leading Haytham to the temple. She had a son by him and raised Connor herself, having left Haytham after learning he didn't actually kill Braddock. She died in a fire from an attack on her village by George Washington, which brings us to her son, Rodon Hagedon, Connor Kenway, aka Desmond's great great grandfather. Rodohan Gaydon, also known as Connor Kenway, which I'm gonna call him Connor Kenway, was born in the Iroquois village of Ganata Zedon in 1756. In 1760, colonial Templar Charles Lee roughed up young Connor Kenway trying to find the first civilization temple. Shortly after, his village was attacked, leading him to believe the Templars were responsible for burning the village and killing his mother. At 13, his grandmother, the clan leader, showed Connor her crystal ball, a piece of Eden, and told him that their people were tasked with guarding the land. Touching the ball, he was transported to the Nexus, where Juno told him to seek out the symbol of the assassins, setting him up to help future descendant Desmond. In 1769, he tracked down Achilles Davenport, one of the two remaining colonial assassins, asking him to train him. Initially refusing, Achilles gave in after Connor waited, broke in, and fought off bandits. Achilles filled him in on Ezio Auditore, starting the assassins' contact with the Isu, for civilization, and of the war between assassins and Templars, revealing the five Templar conspirators they'd need to take down. He learned his mother was Achilles' ally, and his father, Haytham, the Templar Grand Master. Achilles gave him the less conspicuous name Connor after Achilles' deceased son. In 1770, after seeing his father in person for the first time, Connor tried preventing the Templar incited Boston Massacre. This made him a wanted man, though Samuel Adams helped clear his name. Achilles officially inducted Connor into the Brotherhood. He prevented a Templar plot on George Washington's life, along with assisting a number of other historical high points of the American Revolution. In 1782, he killed Charles Lee in Monmouth, New Jersey, taking the Grand Temple amulet from him. In 1783, he again entered the Nexus where Juno instructed him to hide the Grand Temple Key. He did so in the grave of his namesake, Connor Davenport, at Davenport Manor. While camping one night, Connor is met by his now friend, George Washington, who tells him that he discovered a strange orb, an Apple of Eden. After the two of them see visions of the dystopian future that will befall America if Washington is corrupted by the Apple's power, Washington asks Connor to cast the Apple into the sea where no one can ever find it, which he promptly does. And this is where the Kenway and Auditore lines meet. William Miles was born in 1948, uniting the Kenway and Auditore bloodlines. He is Ezio's great-great-great-grandson on his father's side, and Rodon Hatgedon's great-great-grandson on his mother's side. Now we're getting pretty close to our main man, Desmond. In 1977, William Miles stole plans from the Animus from the Templars in Moscow, letting the Order build their own. In 1987, Desmond was born, and William raised him on the farm along with other assassins in training. William took over the Order as mentor in 2000, when the previous mentor was assassinated by a brainwashed Abstergo assassin. He and the other assassins abandoned the farm in 2012, and went into hiding, though he kept in contact with Lucy Stillman regarding Desmond's progress in the Animus. He sent a team in to retrieve Desmond and the Apple of Eden from the Colosseum vault and ordered Desmond placed back in the Animus, where he wrote down coordinates observed by Ezio and Da Vinci in the Pythagorean vault. After Desmond fell into a coma, William transported him and fellow assassin Rebecca Crane to New York. In Assassin's Creed III, when Desmond woke, William and the rest of the assassin team went to the Grand Temple, where William instructed Desmond to be put back in the Animus after he suffered from the bleeding effect. He also put pushed Desmond to go back into the Animus to find the Temple Key faster. He was captured by Abstergo as leverage against Desmond while in the Cairo Museum retrieving a third power source. Once inside the Grand Temple, William tried dissuading Desmond from touching the pedestal that would save Earth, but release Juno and kill him. It didn't work. Six months after Desmond's death, William left the Order, though he ultimately returned in 2014. Desmond Miles. It all comes down to this guy.
I don't know which hand I had the mic in. At age 16, tired of living on the farm with conspiracy-prone parents, Desmond runs away to New York City. He works as a bartender and at some point unknowingly fathers a son, Elijah. How that's possible, I don't know. One day, he's kidnapped by Abstergo Industries and tossed into the Animus, setting this whole chain in motion. Having two assassin lineages and just chock full of Isu DNA, Desmond's ancestral memories help him and the entire Brotherhood work against the Templars through time, ultimately uncovering a disturbing history of humanity that includes a potentially fatal future. Dun, dun, dun. And there you have it, a bloodline that trickled down through the ages and give us Desmond Miles and the entire Assassin's Creed series. It's time to take things back to the beginning, and I'm not talking about 2007. I'm talking about where it all originates. We've got 107 facts about Assassin's Creed Origins that you should know. Assassin's Creed Origins was officially announced in June 2017 during Microsoft's press conference at E3. However, the rumor mill was turning long before then when talks of an Assassin's Creed game codenamed, quote, Empire, began circulating on message boards. Among these rumors were speculation that developer Ubisoft would break their six-year streak of yearly game releases after Assassin's Creed Syndicate did not receive the sales they were hoping for. This rumor held true. Two years after Assassin's Creed Syndicate's release on October 23, 2015, Origins hit store shelves on October October 27th, 2017. Just in time for some Halloween gaming. It came out on the Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC. The development on Origins was led by Ubisoft's Montreal location. This development team previously worked on Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, a highly praised entry in the series set in the golden age of piracy. This time, players are dropped into ancient Egypt for the game setting, more specifically Memphis and Alexandria. You step into the shoes of Bayek of Siwu. He's the last of the Magi, which were a sort of ancient Egyptian police force. The Magi were a real organization in ancient Egypt around the time that Origins takes place. They functioned as a police force and are also thought to have served as the pharaoh's bodyguards. Origins is not the first time that the Magi have been featured in media. In the 1999 film The Mummy, the character Ardeth Bey is a Magi chieftain. It took a great deal of technical skill to get this virtual Egypt off the snuff. Ubisoft even used satellite images and NASA documentation to get colors, particle effects, lighting, and more just right. Water can even be muddy or clear. New AI systems were created as well, to ensure this open world felt as alive as possible. Ubisoft has stated, quote, Most NPCs have full day cycles where they work, socialize, eat, go to the bathroom, sleep, and so on based on their role in the world. Bandits ambush and steal, the Ptolemaic soldiers collect taxes and protect their military locations, priests manage their temples, farmers farm, lions hunt, gazelles roam and sleep, etc. Unlike past games, Origins has a quest-based system where many of the NPCs may have quests or missions for you. You can pick up multiple quests and do them in whatever order you prefer. Do as much or as little as you want. This was created so that the player can have more autonomy and also so they can learn about Egyptian history with hundreds of stories. There are essentially three factions in the game. When NPCs cross each other, depending on how they are aligned, they may start fighting. This is part of a greater AI overhaul for the game. The three factions are the rebels, whom Bayek usually associates with and who are against the boy king Ptolemy, the bandits who are basically out for themselves and will pillage things, and the Ptolemies who have aligned themselves with Ptolemy. They are the tax collectors and also take prisoner. Along with new location and protagonist, Origins features some new gameplay elements like the revamped Eagle Vision. You won't have to scale buildings to see the full map in this game. This time, Eagle Vision is accomplished with the help of Sinu, who is Bayek's eagle companion. You will literally look through the eagle's eyes as she flies up above and scouts for you. Senu is a Bonelli's eagle, a bird of prey native to the location the game takes place in. According to developers, Senu's inclusion was inspired by Mongolian hunters. This type of hunting utilizes golden eagles and is still practiced today. The eagle companion companion required detailed animation work on everything from her feathers to her eyes due to the inability to use motion capture on actual eagles. This was all done by one animator named Sonia Pronovost. While an eagle would not have made for a good motion capture subject, other animals did. The developers even managed to motion capture a camel. Skill trees have also been revamped for Origins. In previous games, they were divided into combat, stealth, and ecosystem. In Origins, the skill tree is comprised of specialties like hunter, warrior, and seer. Another change is the gameplay. Origins takes more of an action RPG approach to gameplay, with features like leveling your character as you play. There was a giant snake-like creature revealed in the E3 trailer seen in a 
showdown with Bayek. Does this mean that the series that's normally so grounded in reality will include some more fantastical creatures? Or was the fight a dream? You'll just have to play to find out. Although Origins is a successor to Assassin's Creed Syndicate, many gaming news sites have described the game as a soft reboot, due to this being the earliest game in the timeline as well as all the new gameplay features. However, developers have stressed that the name Origins simply comes from this being the origins of the Brotherhood. Origins was announced along with a playable demo for E3 attendees. Players of the demo experienced a mission in which Bayek must prove a slave boy's innocence. Two golden statues are missing after the boy accidentally wrecks the boat they're on. Were the statues sunk or stolen? It's up to Bayek to find out. Ubisoft had to work closely with Egyptologists and other experts to ensure Origins' portrayal of the ancient land is as authentic as possible, from landscape to animals. Not only that, they spent time to make sure the details of the society and culture were as accurate and complete as possible as well, including things like class hierarchy, religion, travel, construction, farms, trade, irrigation systems, aqueducts, and more. In fact, there's a position held by Maxime Durand called Historical Researcher. As you might have guessed, this role is dedicated to making sure the gameplay, narrative, designs, and more hold true to historical events and locations. Maxime Durand made sure the development team knew how important religion was to the people of that time and place. He explained, quote, they would believe in cures, they would believe that the gods would help them or keep them from harm, for instance. So that's really important to play with in the quest system. The ecosystem was also taken into consideration and needs to be factored in by the players as well. For example, if you kill a bird, you can use materials from its body for crafting, but if you're not quick enough to retrieve it after killing it, it could be snatched up by an eagle or attract crocodiles with its scent of blood. Obviously, research and contributions from experts was invaluable to the team and the game's development. However, occasionally, gaps had to be filled in by the art team. For example, ancient Egyptian works of art were once painted bright, vivid colors, though time has eroded that paint away. Artists had to envision what those colors might have looked like. Fans have been hard at work deciphering the hieroglyphs on a wall behind presenter and game director Ashraf Ismail. After he said, quote, you know the hieroglyphs? It's not just art on a wall, they actually say stuff. You know that giant mural behind me yesterday when I was doing the conference? There's a meaning there. Fans on Reddit found that the mural contained several sentences after much translating and research. Among them was the sentence, quote, we work in the dark to serve the light, which are words commonly recited during the initiation of a new assassin into the Brotherhood. As with previous Assassin's Creed games, you'll interact with historical figures over the course of the game. The events of Origins occur during the reign of Cleopatra, giving players the chance to meet one of Egypt's final rulers. The Egypt found within Origins aims to be as varied as its real-world counterpart. In a Q&A, developers at Ubisoft said, quote, Many imagine Egypt as mostly desert, but in fact, the country features a lot of different landscapes and ecosystems, and it was even more the case of that period of time. It is a varied, grandiose, and magnificent setting, and we wanted to do it justice and showcase it in all its beauty. The choice to set the game in ancient Egypt was one that pleased both the team and the fans. Ubisoft has stated that this location was one of their most requested. They also wanted to explore the quote, mystery and discovery of the historic time and location. To be specific about the time frame of Origins, the exact date the game starts is 49 BCE. Players will have a front seat to the beginning of Egypt's fall and some of the events leading up to that. Returning to compose the game's soundtrack was Sarah Schachner, who also worked on previous titles in the series like Black Flag and Unity. The voice and motion capture for main character Bayek was done by Abu Bakr Salim, who has had roles on TV shows like Black Mirror. Salim is an avid gamer and a fan of the Assassin's Creed series. Working on Origins marked a first for him. He said in an interview, quote, This is my first video game job and the experience as a whole was a mixture of liberating, exciting, tough, and genuinely fun. The passion and love from the team is so strong that the work environment was a joy to be a part of. Voice acting in a video game? And that game being Assassin's Creed? What's not to love? One of the historical figures in the game, Julius Caesar, was voiced by Michael Nardon. But this isn't the first time he's been cast as a Roman. Nardon has also played Massius in the TV show Rome. Players can also partake in some Roman pastimes thanks to features like the gladiator arenas. While the first of these arenas is involved in the main story of the game, most are just for fun, and they're a great place to get loot. In these arenas, you can try out some of Origin's new weapons like spears, maces, bows, bombs, and more. There's more tools of mayhem at Bayek's disposal than any assassin before him. Bayek also has access to a variety of mounts like camels, chariots, and horses. Customization is said to be a huge aspect of Origins. As a result, there are many outfits to choose from. You can tour Egypt in style. Parkour like never before. The developers switched to a code drive system which improved the responsiveness of the parkour moves. Plus, nearly everything is now climbable. From buildings to rocks, Bayek can now scale with ease. Narratively speaking, you are exploring Egypt through the Animus, like in previous games. Assassin's Creed usually features storylines happening in both the past and present, but we won't spoil any of the modern-day aspects of Origins, so hurry up and play
play. Much of the story concerns Bayek. With his background in the Magi, Bayek is a character with a very clear and unwavering sense of right and wrong. He's been described as, quote, compassionate and sympathetic. Ubisoft has called him essentially the embodiment of ancient Egypt. Bayek can suffer from heat stroke. According to developers, being out in the desert heat too long and unprotected may result in Bayek's vision becoming hazy, as well as other effects on what they call desert overheat. One small but oft-requested feature in Origins is the ability to toggle Bayek's hood on and off. Got multiple players in one household? Or maybe you just like the option to have multiple save files? Well, Ubisoft has heard you. After many requests, you can once again have more than one save file in an Assassin's Creed game. The game also has a photo mode, so you can take shots in-game. Ashraf Ismail revealed this to fans on his Twitter page just weeks before the game. You don't have to wait all day to complete a night mission in Origins. Just hold down R3 to fast-forward time. Now, if only I had that option at my day job. In another first for the series, Origins allows players to explore underwater environments in a way that's far more seamless than Black Flag. There's more shipwrecks to explore here, though you'll be on the lookout for crocodiles and hippos instead of sharks. In Origins, players can use more of the environment to their favor in encounters. For example, animals. Surprise your foes by releasing their caged animals from afar with your bow. Animals can also be used more directly. Bayek can use his sleep darts to, quote, tame the wild animals he finds. Once tamed, these ferocious friends will not only follow you, they'll fight for you. No need to tame Zenu, though. Your eagle is already with you. In addition to helping you expand the map, she can distract enemies and even locate potential threats. And who needs a mini-map when you've got an eagle, right? In addition to the standard dangers of Assassin's Creed games, Bayek also goes up against, quote, boss characters. These fights are naturally much tougher than combat with regular enemies. One of these bosses is the Slaver. Bayek can also fire multiple arrows with the warrior's bow in an archery technique that is actually found in ancient Egyptian paintings. This bow has been called the game's shotgun. Some of Bayek's archery skills are a lot like those of famed Danish archer Lars Anderson. Though he is not a confirmed inspiration for Bayek's skills, Anderson was inspired by some of the same ancient art that the Origins team studied. Our Magi main character also has some abilities not rooted in fact, like a bullet time-like feature that lets you guide how your arrow flies. Do you think folks at Ubisoft are avid fans of the movie, um, wanted? Bayek's hometown of Siwa is not only a real location, but it is also a place of historical significance. Alexander the Great visited the oasis, and there is even some debate about whether or not his tomb is located there. However, in ancient Egyptian times, the oasis was called Sektam, which means palm land. This likely comes from the many date palm and olive trees that can be found there even today. The Siwa oasis was also home to the Temple of Amun, the ram-headed god of sun and air. Within the temple was a famous oracle that Alexander the Great consulted with. In Origins, Bayek is married to a woman named Aya. She is half Egyptian, half Greek, and is also highly trained herself. She plays a role in forming the Assassin's Brotherhood along with Bayek. Aya works for Cleopatra and steadfastly believes in the ruler. Bayek is not as trusting, which leads to some tension in their relationship over the game. Another historical figure who has been previously mentioned in Assassin's Creed games and will finally be making an appearance is Julius Caesar. As he was in real life, Caesar is instrumental in helping Cleopatra fight back against her brother after she's exiled. Caesar's death is another that, within the lore of Assassin's Creed, is a murder carried out by the Assassin Brotherhood. It do brotherhood? It wouldn't be an Assassin's Creed game without the iconic hidden blade. The one we see Bayek using is one of the first of its kind given the year that the game takes place. Like other early hidden blades, Bayek requires the amputation of the ring finger to properly use. However, it does look and function a bit differently, appearing to use a string to eject the blade. Bayek's hidden blade must also be upgraded to be effective. Crafting systems in the game allow players to improve their weapons and equipment. In order for your hidden blade to be the insta-kill assassin's tool that it's meant to be, you'll have to upgrade it. There are three main paths that Bayek can take on the game's ability tree. The Master Hunter path makes him more proficient with ranged weapons, the Master Seer with tools, and the Master Warrior for melee. One of current gaming's biggest trends is to make trailers with haunting songs, or at least an eerie cover of a popular song. You Want It Darker by Leonard Cohen was used in the Origins trailer showcased at Gamescom 2017. Players can use a feature called Animus Pulse to look for objects that can be interacted with. It's almost like Eagle Vision in previous games. Another switch up in Origins is Bayek's use of a shield. Because the gameplay of this installment can take a more action-based turn if players so choose, defenses for Bayek had to be reconsidered. That shield is handy for more than just defense, though. Block oncoming arrow fire with the shield, and Bayek now has some fresh arrows to launch back at his enemies. Way to recycle. One thing that's remained the same is the naming of key characters in the Assassin's Creed universe after a bird of prey. Bayek's name in particular comes from translating the hieroglyph for Falcon. Bayek even wears an eagle skull amulet. Wonder how Sinu feels about that one. Some astute fans have pointed out that the logo for the Assassin's Creed franchise looks like the bottom of an eagle skull. The way Bayek wears his amulet, with the bottom facing out, also resembles this. Sinu serves as a scout for the player, and a good one at that. According to tweets by the game director, 
character, Senu has no limits to how far she can fly on the map. Even though it's Senu who now expands your map, don't worry, there's still reason to scale tall buildings. In Origins, viewpoints allow you to fast travel to locations. Unlike in previous games, Origins combat relies on a hitbox system. No more swing at an open air here. Where you position yourself in relation to enemies is now a greater part of combat. Luckily, you have plenty of weapons to choose from in your battles. Over 150 of them. Gotta catch them all, right? Will we see any familiar faces in Origins? There's no way to know for sure until the game's release. However, one highly probable possibility is the ancient Egyptian assassin Amunet, whose tomb you enter in Assassin's Creed 2. Amunet is also the name of the Egyptian goddess of air and invisibility. It's also the female version of the name Amun, and since Bayek's home of Siwa houses the Temple of Amun, well, this conspiracy theory is coming together quite nicely. Amunet is a respected assassin in the Assassin's Creed lore who murdered Cleopatra using an asp. An asp is the word used for various species of deadly serpents in the region the game takes place. Here's the little history lesson. It's believed that Cleopatra committed suicide by goading a poisonous snake into biting her. However, now it's believed she may have simply poisoned herself. A series of short videos created by Ubisoft called Tales from the Tomb were released on YouTube preceding the game's launch. These often humorous videos featured animated ancient paintings. They were called, quote, birds, boat tour, and hopped up. Which was your favorite? Who would have thought that, quote, war elephants would be an issue? In Origins, armored elephants are one animal that your enemies use to their advantage. When people think of Egypt, often deserts are one of the first things that come to mind. However, since the Egypt we created within Origins is vast, you'll see far more than desert. You'll even see rain in certain areas. This time, there is no mini-map to aid you in exploring Origins. Instead, players follow markers that give the general but not exact location of items and destinations. Some have compared it to a system found in the Elder Scrolls games. A degree of sailing even makes its return to the game, something well within the developer's wheelhouse given the extensive sailing in Black Flag. Players can now choose their difficulty level in Origins, and whatever level you start out with, you don't have to stick with for the entire game. You have the option to switch mid-game. That is amazing! I really needed that in the first one. There are no loading screens as you explore this ancient Egypt. Origins features a seamless experience. Xbox One players should prepare for a hefty download if they decide to purchase Origins digitally. The game is 42.3 gigabytes. Pre-ordering Assassin's Creed Origins gave early birds access to an additional mission called Secrets of the First Pyramids. In it, players got to discover some of the mysteries surrounding one of Egypt's signature landmarks, the pyramids, and how they came to be constructed. There are seven different editions of Origins that were available for pre-order, from Standard, which includes just the game, to the Dawn of the Creed Legendary Edition, which comes with everything from a Bayek statue to an art book. For a limited time, Final Fantasy XV players can get the free expansion Assassin's Festival until January 31st, 2018. Players who got the expansion soon after it released in August 2017 had a limited time to unlock the Master Assassin costume for Noctis, which was available until late September 2017. Origins also partnered with Monster Energy Drinks to create special cans featuring both art for the characters and the chance to win prizes both in the game and outside of it. The grand prize is a trip to the Ubisoft studio that developed the game. The promotion goes until March 2018, so you still got time. Want an experience that's a little less assassin and a little more, um, educational? The Discover Tour mode might be what you're looking for, which will be available in early 2018 as a free update. There's no combat in Discover Tour. Instead, you'll visit the game's historic locations to learn about life in ancient Egypt. Ubisoft calls the Discovery Tour a, quote, combat-free living museum, with guided tours that let players delve into its history firsthand. You'll even be able to go on guided tours curated by Egyptologists. Hey, it's cheaper than a plane ticket. UK fans can get their hands on a set of Origins-themed Bluetooth headphones for about 265 US dollars. They're limited edition and one of a few collectibles available. However, if you're looking to game in serious style, you can drop about $58,000 on a fancier set of Assassin's Creed Origins headphones, which are a collaborative creation with the French jewelers Tournaire. They're 18 karat gold. You can even buy a figure of Bayek's head to rest these headphones on for another $14,500. You know, just jump change. However, there are only 10 of these sets that exist in the world. If you want to get the full story of Origins, you'll have to check out Assassin's Creed Origins Desert Oath by Oliver Bowden. This novel is a prequel to the game and explores some of Bayek's earlier life. If you're a series fan, you may have heard that name before. Anton Jill has written eight other Assassin's Creed novelizations under the pen name Oliver Bowden. There will also be new entries into the Assassin's Creed comic series inspired by events in Origins. These will be written by Anne Toole and published by Titan Comics. In case you weren't counting, this is the 24th Assassin's Creed game in the video game franchise. Here's hoping for a 25th. Speaking of Origins and Odyssey and the original Assassin's Creed even, it's always fun to see how things have changed over the years. Ever wonder exactly how much has changed? 
Well, we've got a fantastic comparison video that does just that. Sci-Fi Slim Down The story of the original Assassin's Creed came as somewhat of a shock when on November 13, 2007 fans finally got their hands on the game. A majority of the gameplay and promotional trailers showcased the game taking place in the historical backdrop of the Holy Land during the Third Crusade in the year 1191. It was a bit of a surprise then when fans saw that the game opens up in the year 2012 in the white-paneled, glimmering interior of Abstergo Industries. Players took control of Desmond Miles, an ancient ancestor of Altair, an assassin whose memories contain vital information for Abstergo Industries. Abstergo was on the hunt to find the location of a sacred treasure to the Templars, a piece of Eden, and only Desmond's ancestor Altair knew where it was hidden. Though somewhat jarring, the sci-fi elements brought a fresh, albeit somewhat convoluted premise to the series. Assassin's Creed 2 would later perfectly encapsulate this feeling with Desmond after being visited by a member of an ancient race called the First Civilization, voicing his own confusion with with the literal WTF. Over the years, Assassin's Creed has distanced itself from their science fiction storyline. Desmond's story has faded through the years and hasn't really been replaced by anything of equal significance. Some Assassin's Creed games would almost ignore this aspect of the game completely, pushing the historically stealthy stabby parts to the forefront. With the advent of Assassin's Creed Origins, it looks like this title will be continuing on this path as well. While the game does trace back to the original conflict between the Assassins and the Templars, there there has been little to no mention of any gameplay taking place in present day. In an interview with Eurogamer Ashraf Ismail, creative director of Black Flag and game director of Origins, did not confirm that there would be a modern day section of the game. When asked, he replied that, we want to do justice to those fans who have supported us, so it will be an authentic Assassin's Creed experience. Ismail could be playing coy and not revealing the modern day section because he wants it to remain a surprise until the game is in the player's hands. At the same time, this could just be hinting even further at a limited role for the modern day section in Origins. Crafting Better Empires Each Assassin's Creed is always tasked with no easy feat, faithfully recreating a fully realized society. For the original Assassin's Creed, fans were able to run, climb, and assassinate their way through three cities, Jerusalem, Acre, and Damascus. These cities featured iconic landmarks that any historian would be able to spot, as well as a thriving population of city dwellers. Creating with the scimitar engine, now called the Anvil, Assassin's Creed boasted a large map with some breathtaking views. The art style and historical accuracy invoked positive critical reception, though reviews lamented that there was little to do in these sprawling cities. Unfortunately, original Assassin's Creed stumbled in its mission variety. Players were dealt a small hand of side missions to accompany the main story quest, such as information gathering, pickpocketing, saving citizens, and eavesdropping. With even positive reviews like that of the Game Informers, Critics felt that these missions soon ran redundant, knocking OG Assassin's Creed for its lack of ingenuity. Subsequent games in the series did try to widen mission variety, while keeping many of the same missions that debuted in the original. In Assassin's Creed Black Flag, recent highlights included scavenger hunts and treacherous ship battles. Famous historical figures were now featured as the quest givers in side missions, fully fleshing out the inhabitants of these ancient cities and allowing players to interact with some of history's greatest inventors, thinkers, and leaders. In the most recent game, 2015's Assassin's Creed Syndicate, players were given the chance to kidnap on behalf of Charles Darwin and even fight ghosts and ghouls with Charles Dickens. Origins is leading the change forward for the series in terms of graphic fidelity, cultural integration, and mission structure. Origins takes place 3,000 years ago in the city of Memphis, Egypt. Origins is being created by the Anvil Next 2.0 engine, the same engine that Ubisoft used for Assassin's Creed Syndicate, For Honor, and Ghost Recon Wildlands. The engine has some incredible features that benefit open world games such as dynamic weather, more realistic lighting and physics, with even clothing moving more realistically on characters. In terms of historical recreation, the fidelity of the Anvil Next now allows for an almost one-to-one -one likeness ratio between monuments in the game and their real-world counterparts. Assassin's Creed Unity's Notre Dame was able to look so breathtakingly real because of this. Unlike the original Assassin's Creed, which had loading zones in between 
between the big cities, Origins is promising a much more immersive experience thanks to Ubisoft's impressive engine. It's not only the buildings and the cloth that are getting upgrades, but the residents of Memphis will be much livelier as well. While 2007 Assassin's Creed did have civilians who would occasionally help Altair by grabbing guards, most denizens of the Holy Land acted as no more than set dressing. In Origins, the developers are making it clear that the population of Memphis will be living out their own lives, regardless of what your character is doing. The developers claim that the city will be rich with people who have their own agendas and their own things to do. This will be a far cry from 2007's Assassin's Creed and allow players to sufficiently sink their teeth into the culture and common life of ancient Egypt. Utilizing Anvil Next, Origins looks to push the envelope even further with what can be achieved in the open world genre. Combat Evolved Fighting has always been a patchy area for Assassin's Creed. The original equipped Altair with a few tools to take down the Templars. Most players had to rely on his trusty hidden blades, but if you were like me and, uh, well, really bad at being stealthy, you would have to find your way out of most assassinations. These larger fights always featured Altair taking down a huge mob of enemies one by one. Enemies would form a circle around the player, with each engaging you one at a time until they're all defeated. This fighting structure is what Origins game director Asrath Ismail calls the paired animation system. As he describes it, when a player presses attack, the player character and an enemy will come together almost regardless of distance, play an animation, and split apart. While many things have changed over the years for Assassin's Creed, this area of gameplay has had few innovations. Until now, that is. Ismail is changing directions for Origins, stating that the team wants to reinvent what it means to be Assassin's Creed. After finishing production on Black Flag, the team set out to put a fresh face on combat, among other things, in the franchise. To do so, the team is steering away from the paired animation fighting system and is instead doing a hitbox-based system. What this means is that when players hit attack, instead of initiating an animation like in 2007's Assassin's Creed, players will simply swing their weapon. If there is an enemy, players will hit. If there's nothing there, they will miss. The hitbox system sounds simple, but it opens itself up to new avenues of gameplay. Factors like enemy location, weapon range, speed, player loadout, player positioning, and enemy loadout will now have a dynamic effect on combat. While the original Assassin's Creed combat was very limited, with a basic attack counter, grab, and dodge move, Origins is expanding the moveset to allow for a more versatile approach to combat. Players will now have the option of a light attack and a heavy attack, which they could combo together Players can also parry enemies, charge up their heavy attack, and take out the footing of their enemies with the proper combo. The additions don't end there, as players will also have an adrenaline meter at the bottom of their screens. This meter will fill up during regular combat by landing hits on enemies. When full, unleashing the meter will allow players to use devastating attacks on their foes. These attacks vary depending on which weapon you're using, with some delivering single killing blows and others putting the player into fury mode, where they get to rain devastating station down upon their enemies for about 10 seconds. Sounds fun! With their new combat system also comes a revamped way to go about engaging the enemy. Assassin's Creed Syndicate introduced a skill tree system, allowing players to choose upgrades to either Jacob or Evie that would allow them to be better at stealth or head on combat. The skills didn't tip the scales too highly in either character's favor, but it was a refreshing change of pace for a series that allowed players to tackle mission objectives any way they saw fit. Origins is continuing the skill tree for the Egyptian assassin Bayek and is adding some much needed depth to the system. In the abilities section of the in-game menu, players will receive points that they can spend when leveling up. It is divided into three sections, Warrior, Hunter, and Seer. These additions will allow players a more custom gameplay experience that some found lacking in the original. While 2007's Assassin's Creed did have some advanced combat techniques, such as defense and grab breaks, they ultimately seem like a placeholder for a better system that was in the works. Origins will buck this trend come October with a wide variety of both weapons and techniques along with a completely revamped fighting style. This is great news for players like me who can't seem to stealth kill anyone even if our lives depended on it. A Walk on the Wild Side Attributing the somewhat sterile appearance of the 2007's Assassin's Creed was the apparent lack of any real wildlife in the Holy Land. Damascus, Acre, and Jerusalem did feature the iconic eagle soaring above, and Altair did ride his trusty white steed from city to city, but aside from that, there wasn't much else.
themselves. Assassin's Creed 3 drastically changed that by adding an interactive wildlife, which fit hand in hand with the culture of the Native American protagonist, Connor. Players were challenged with successful tracking, killing, and skinning wildlife such as bears, beavers, cougars, deer, and more. Black Flag took this mechanic one step further by adding sea creatures into the mix as well, the most notable being the inclusion of shark hunting. Besides bringing back bad flashbacks from Treasure Trove Cove and Banjo-Kazooie, these shark hunts not only added a nice variety to the gameplay, but made the wilds of America and the seas of the Caribbean feel like they were full of life. Assassin's Creed is no stranger to animal appreciation, having players actually take control of an eagle for the first time. The eagle, named Senu, will allow players to scout out areas such as bandit camps and let Bayek plan out his attack accordingly. Bayek will also be traversing Memphis on camelback, which is pretty noteworthy in and of itself because, well, camels are amazing. Bayek will also be battling some pretty nasty animals, including a giant snake seen in the reveal trailer for the game. Egypt's wide variety of habitats allow for a multitude of animals to thrive, such as flamingos, cheetahs, hyenas, and leopards. Including a robust wildlife system adds an additional layer of immersion and gameplay that was absent from the original Assassin's Creed. 2007's Assassin's Creed, while at the time a definite trendsetter in terms of open world development and immersive parkour gameplay, certainly has its fair share of differences from its most recent iterations. With Origins due to the release this fall, fans will get to experience what 10 years of storytelling, combat, and world building have taught Assassin's Creed. Our little Altair is all grown up. Once again, I'm Alex with the leaderboard, and thanks for taking a look back with us at Then vs. Now Assassin's Creed. This franchise has seen some very interesting changes throughout the years, and Origins looks like it's going to be the craziest one yet. Plenty has changed indeed, from storylines to graphics to the mechanics of each game. One major change over the year has to be combat. Assassination has to change or else it gets too predictable, right? Nobody's trying anything at Ford's Theater these days. Now that I've made a very presidential joke, let's take a peek at how Assassin's Creed combat has evolved. Assassin's Creed 1. The game that brought the series to life, Assassin's Creed 1, puts you in the body of mega assassin Altair. When he's not disrespecting his elders, he's sneaking around the Holy Land eavesdropping. Assassin's Creed 1 sets the combat tone of the original series. Focusing on stealth, it takes to heart the creed, hide in plain sight, be one with the crowd. For the most part, you'll be going for those one-stab kills, pouncing on your enemies with your hidden blade, or throwing a dagger into some poor unsuspecting guard before blending seamlessly back into a a group of scholars or scampering up a building. However, when you do have to get down and dirty, you'll find that Altair can tussle with the best of them. Hack and Slash is the name of the game here, and using your sword, there are about a dozen moves and counter moves in which to fend off multiple attackers. Effective combat here is largely going to fall on good timing, and while it is a hack and slash, button mashing isn't going to help you much. We'll be honest, it's not the best combat game. Assassin's Creed 2. A direct continuation of the previous game, Assassin's Creed 2 took all that was good in the first game and made it great in this one. With the focus remaining on stealth skills, our young Italian hitman Ezio now has a number of updated combat mechanics and options that really add finesse to his stabbing. Instead of just stabbing at a lone Templar with a hidden dagger, you can now stab at them with two hidden daggers, stab at them while leaping down from a high ledge, stab at them from the safety of a bale of hay, or or just go the old-fashioned way and pull them off a ledge. You know, after stabbing them, of course. Sneaking has also been kicked up a notch, and instead of just finding groups of scholars, you're able to slip off into any Italian crowd. You can even get creative and distract the guards by throwing money or smoke bombs, as well as hiring thieves or even prostitutes to distract them. What a glorious era 14th century Italy was. Assassin's Creed 2 opens up a virtual smorgasbord of weapons for you to play around with, with the added option of disarming an opponent and taking away the weapon that he was holding. Options range from hammers to spears to maces. There's even a particularly giant axe that you can borrow from the heavy guards for extra fun. But probably the best new weapon is the poison blade, which causes your victim to stumble around, causing a distraction, and the hidden pistol that will blow your enemies away. Literally. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. At this point, Assassin's Creed can do no wrong. Not only do we end up getting sentimentally attached to our boy Ezio, but the gameplay in Brotherhood 
Brotherhood is just so much fun. Brotherhood's additions to the combat system helped smooth out Assassin's Creed's admittedly clunky battle mechanics. Everything has been sped up, and while the swordplay is better, it becomes slightly too easy to string together one slash kills. The new kill streak feature allows Ezio to continuously move from enemy to enemy and perform multiple takedowns and executions using melee weapons. You can even perform dual executions as well. Sick. Keeping the theme of Brotherhood in mind, you can now recruit some assassins to your side by earning the loyalty of the common folk. Once they're loyal to you, you can send them out on missions and even call for their assistance in battle. Eventually, they become fully fledged assassins. Calling your fellow assassins into battle brings about either a rain of arrows, them leaping out of a haystack, or charging in on horseback to help you fight. There really is nothing more satisfying than recruiting assassins and running Rome like a 15th century mob boss while they do all your dirty work. I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about one of the best new weapons in Brotherhood, the crossbow, which was basically a gun. More satisfactory than throwing knives, the crossbow lets you take down unsuspecting targets from afar. Assassin's Creed Revelations. Revelations isn't a bad game per se, but it's also not a new game, and releasing Assassin's Creed year after year like FIFA led to some cloak and dagger fatigue. Set only a few years after Brotherhood, in Revelations, Ezio is older and apparently less concerned with stealth. The core gameplay mechanics remain about the same, with the biggest gameplay addition being the hook blade. A modification of the hidden blade, the hook blade consisted both of a curved hook and a regular blade, allowing you to zip line over the city as well as pickpocket someone mid-combat using the old hook and run technique. Surprisingly enough, Revelation has given Ezio bombs. Not the traditional weapon for an assassin, these are some down and dirty DIY explosives that you'll be crafting. Fill them up with anything you want. Gunpowder, smoke, poison gas, and if you want to make it rain, you can even fill it up with gold. Minstrels love gold. Assassin's Creed 3. The Wild American Frontier trades buildings for trees, counters for quick time events, and gameplay for bugs. Battles are quicker this time. They're more fluid, as Connor can now auto-lock, so slashing and somersaulting his way around the battlefield is easy. Unfortunately, nobody told this to the camera crew, as we're met with some janky camera angles. On the plus side, there's a new mechanic where you can now fling an enemy body across you as a human shield. Assassin's Creed 3 adds a new element, hunting. There's no real need to go hunting for the story's sake, but jumping from a tree branch and killing a bunny from above is pretty fun. The material also comes in handy for crafting. The introduction of naval combat is a game changer for the Assassin's Creed series. Connor isn't just an assassin, but a captain too. It's majestic to sail the Aquila, firing and dodging cannonballs on the high seas. More often than not, you'll probably just be ramming straight into an enemy ship for a bloody melee showdown. Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag Black Flag is the non-assassin Assassin's Creed game. Edward Kenway, while possessing all the free-running and stabbing skills of an assassin, is more of a rogue who would rather be out looting. In Black Flag, you're a 17th century pirate, and your equipment has been updated. Trading out knives and broadswords, you now sport dual-wielding pistols, cutlass swords, as well as a blowpipe and rope darts, which you're gonna need for those painfully annoying snipers. Now let's get down to the pirate stuff. You're gonna be spending about 50% of your time in Black Flag out on the water, and while you can board enemies to take their crew via melee combat, you can also leap from mast to mast and come hurtling down on your enemies. As for the actual ship battles, you'll be using your cannon, mortar, or fire barrels to take down enemy ships. Assassin's Creed Rogue Rogue, aka Black Flag version 2, introduces us to the most Irish of Irishmen, Shea Patrick Cormac. Cormac is one of the most interesting characters in the series, and he isn't even an assassin. He's a Templar. Being a Templar is pretty nifty. Like the Decepticons, they always get the best stuff. As a Templar, you get an air rifle instead of a blowpipe, as well as a pretty hefty grenade launcher. Your ship is cooler, with puckle guns instead of swivel guns, and you've even got an early machine gun on your ship. Most of Rogue plays like Black Flag. You sail your ship around, listen to pirate shanties, dig for treasure, beat people up in bars, and blow up other ships. Assassin's Creed Unity We're back on land, and everything in Unity is comfortingly similar to the beginning of the Assassin's Creed series. Unity opens up the sandbox world of the British-sounding French Revolution, giving us a free 
free-form way to assassinate people. No longer are we bound by the rules of poisoning a drink or sneaking through a certain entrance. In Unity, you can decide how to kill your target. And isn't that what being an assassin is all about? Customization reigns supreme in Unity, laying down the groundwork for future Assassin's Creed titles. You customize your weapons as well as your appearance in Unity, with different items offering varying bonuses to different aspects of the game, such as pants and boots that decrease fall damage or running noise. There are about 200 pieces of gear in Unity, and trust me, it can get frustrating to keep track of. The combat has undergone a revamp as well. Gone are the chained execution moves of Black Flag and Assassin's Creed 3. It's now far more challenging to take down large groups of enemies as you can no longer spam your defensive moves. The counter button has been replaced by a parry command, and even if you've mastered all the moves, Arno himself can only handle a couple of blows before he gets his ass handed to him. Fun fact, Ubisoft has said that the new combat system is inspired by fencing, which explains the back and forth parry and riposte structure. Another big addition to the customization train is your character skill tree, which is split into four distinct categories, melee, ranged, stealth, and health, where you'll be able to choose where you want to spend your points on. Some of the previous standards, such as double assassinations and role recovery, will now need to be unlocked as well. Sadly, multiplayer has been removed in Unity, but has since been replaced with co-op, allowing you to summon up to three friends to run around and explore, or to engage in a collection of heist and assassination missions. Assassin's Creed Syndicate Syndicate refreshes the gameplay of Assassin's Creed franchise with not one, but two lead assassins, Jacob and Evie Fry. Both characters are interchangeable throughout the game and use two different playstyles. Jacob has health and extra damage on his side, but Evie is faster, stealthier, and in a way, more brutal. The Templars have taken over Victorian London, and there's a restriction on open weaponry, so combat has shifted to focus more on hand-to-hand -hand or concealed weapons such as brass knuckles or cane swords. You'll start the game with your trusty throwing knives that now have the added feature of activating traps in the environment, such as hanging barrels. The combat mechanics are similar to Unity, but have been ramped up a notch to be more action-heavy. Think Batman Arkham Asylum. You'll need to attack and counterattack your way through half a dozen foes in any given street fight, but the game now keeps track of your combos. You can upgrade your skills so that a higher combo means a faster dispatch, or weaken multiple enemies at once for brutal multiple takedowns. In Syndicate, you don't have a brotherhood per se, but you do have your own street urchin gang called the Rooks. Like your previous assassins, they can be upgraded, called into combat, and sent out on missions. Assassin's Creed Origins Origins doesn't even try to hide the fact that it's not a stealth game anymore. It's combat heavy, with outcroppings of stealth, crafting, and gear management, but not as much of a focus as with the previous games. Experienced gamers will recognize the new hitbox-based combat melee system of Origins from the Dark Souls series, but easier. This time when you fight, you'll be focusing more on blocking, dodging, and parrying. Origins expands your options by giving you a variety of moves to play with. In addition to a revised combat system, there's a new Mortal Kombat-esque adrenaline gauge that builds up during combat, giving you the ability to finish him or enter frenzy mode, during which Bayek is temporarily faster, stronger, and more resistant to damage. Assassinations have been tweaked slightly, and instead of being able to assassinate anyone with a pulse, your kills are limited to your stats. Your ability to kill is dictated by your level relative to the targets, and how many times you've upgraded your assassin's blade, which just isn't fun at all. The skill trees have gone through an upgrade, with three trees to choose from. Master Warrior, which focuses on melee combat, Master Hunter, which focuses on range combat and stealth, and Master Seer, which focuses on tools and manipulating the environment. Assassin's Creed Odyssey It's time to party like a Spartan, because Odyssey is set in ancient Greece, and it has the most aggressive combat system to date. Gone are the regular scheduled assassin counter kills from the first few games, and say goodbye to blocking altogether, because your shield is gone and has been replaced with the Spear of Leonidas, so expect to flex your pecs to dodge and parry attacks instead. Ancient Spartans were pretty weighed down by their helmets, shields, and weapons that movement wasn't always easy, but thankfully Ubisoft didn't bring that historically accurate detail into the game. If you've watched 300 or if you've taken a look at any ancient Greek pottery, you'll recognize that the spear is the Spartan weapon of choice. In ancient times, Spartan spears were known as dories, and they were by far the most favored weapon. In Odyssey, you'll find that your spear gives you access to long-ranged attacks, stealth moves, and some kick-ass supernatural abilities. The Spartan Kick, which sends enemies flying, unfortunately not into a giant hole of death, is a force push to clear enemies and it can even regenerate your health. These abilities can be used in the middle or end of an attack chain, allowing you to keep your enemies off balance. Your adrenaline meter from the previous game will now charge your spear instead. Ubisoft is touting Odyssey as a full RPG game, so expect a ton of personalization options and 
upwards of 30 abilities to pick from. Assassin's Creed offers players a fascinating window into various historical eras and recreates amazing cities for us to explore. But how about the lore, the mythology? Greek mythology is intertwined through stories the world over, but how about Greek mythology in Assassin's Creed? Let's learn. We'll be looking at the real-world myths that the game's developers drew inspiration from, as well as how those myths were translated into the game itself. For starters, Cassandra, with a K, is one of the main characters in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. She's Amisios, a legendary mercenary who wields the powerful spear of Leonidas. She's also the grandchild of King Leonidas, former emissary kicker and 12-pack ab haver. Mystios is a Greek word that means hired worker. It can also refer to a mercenary. The name Cassandra itself has mythological connections as well. Cassandra, with a C, was the daughter of King Priam of Troy. She was the most beautiful of Priam's daughters, and the god Apollo fell in love with her. Cassandra wasn't interested in Apollo, so he tried to buy her affection by giving her the power of prophecy. Cassandra took the power, but told Apollo to take a hike. The one thing you should never do is tell a lovesick god to take a hike. Apollo let her keep her foresight, but made it so no one would ever believe her visions. So she got a preview of a little thing called the Trojan War, but was helpless to stop it. Apollo sure was a swell guy. But let's get back to that awesome Spear of Leonidas. The spear Cassandra uses is made by the Isu, the gods of the Assassin's Creed universe, and was broken at Leonidas' death. Fun fact, the spear is the first time players can wield an Isu artifact through the whole main game. It grants its wielder special powers that can really come in handy at battle, so it's no wonder Cassandra keeps it close at hand. Similarly, the historical Leonidas would have used a spear as part of his hoplite weapons. A hoplite is the most common type of soldier in a Greek city-state's army. In Athens, all men between 18 and 20 were required to serve in the army, especially in the 4th century BC. In Sparta, all men over 20 were part of a permanent professional army, and in the 5th century, all citizens had to take arms to defend their city. One of the Spartans' most popular weapons was the spear, also called a dory or doru. The spear was an important part of the strategy that helped the Greeks make a showing at Thermopylae. The long spears helped the Greeks compete with the Persians' superior numbers. Speaking of offense, the Spartan kick is a battle technique you can use in the game, a famous and super cool ancient move from ancient times. Or is it? Famous old historian Herodotus tells an interesting version of the Persian War. In Herodotus' version of the tale, Darius, Xerxes' father, sends messengers to Athens and Sparta. In Athens, the messenger is thrown into the pit of punishment, which sounds metal as hell. But in Sparta, they were actually just thrown into an old boring well. Still pretty metal, though. From here, we turn to another ancient and forgotten time, 1998. Famous comic book writer and artist Frank Miller published a comic book called 300, loosely based on the Battle of Thermopylae and the 1962 film The 300 Spartans. In the comic, Leonidas dramatically kicks a Persian emissary into a giant hole while saying the line to end all lines. You know, that line. It's been said on YouTube millions of times over, I'm not saying it again. The actual move itself has roots in MMA and Muay Thai kickboxing, where it's called a push kick. In the game, the Sparta kick is a handy maneuver that's great for knocking back powerful enemies. I mean, who doesn't love kicking rogue warriors off cliffs? And just like in the movie 300, it's already an iconic part of the game. Assassin's Creed Odyssey opens with the Battle of Thermopylae. An army of Spartans led by Leonidas and a rather lethargic crew of Persian soldiers duke it out as the game teaches you to spear and parry your way across the ancient battlefield. But not all the enemies you face in Assassin's Creed Odyssey are human or susceptible to being kicked off cliffs. Greek mythology provided the game developers at Ubisoft with a wide array of monsters and beasts for you to face off within the game. One of the most well-known in Greek mythology is the Minotaur. This Minotaur is revered by the people of Leto, a city on the island of Crete. They built a shrine to the creature which attracts visitors from all over. You also encounter a violent Cretan bull in the game. You know, just a regular, not half man, all bull bull. And that's no bull. Bulls have been associated with the island of Crete going back over 9,000 years. Shrines and statues of Aurochs, a now extinct species of giant cows, were of great importance to the Neolithic people who lived on the island. Knossos, often cited as the oldest city in Europe, was the capital of the Minoan civilization, which also revered the bull. Bull imagery can be seen in the ruins of the palace there even today, which was so grand that it was said to have been designed by the famous inventor Daedalus, father of Icarus. And bulls aren't the only significant
significant critters in the game. There's also an annoyingly difficult fight with a boar early on, so let's see where Ubisoft developers might have drawn their inspiration from. In myth, the fourth of Hercules' ten labors is to defeat the Arimanthian boar. The boar lived on Mount Arimanthus, which was sacred to the goddess Artemis. In typical Greek god fashion, Artemis sent the boar to ravage farms whenever she was feeling petty. This isn't the same boar as appears in Odyssey, but I honestly wouldn't mind Hercules' help with this one because that legendary boar in Odyssey whooped my ass more than once. And in fact, the various quests to hunt fantastic beasts in Odyssey were inspired by the legend of Hercules. The in-game boar is also from Greek mythology. It's the Caledonian boar. This boar is also sent by Artemis when another king doesn't perform proper rites. The Greeks really love tropes, it turns out. Many great heroes took part in the hunt to bring down the Caledonian boar, including Atalanta, a rare woman hero who also sailed with the Argonauts, and Meliger, the prince of Caledon and son of the king. Atalanta wounded the boar first, and Meliger finished it off, but he awarded Atalanta the prize for the kill because he had a big old crush on her. Meliger's uncles were ticked he gave the prize to a woman, and in the ensuing argument, Meliger killed them, and then his mom kills him. Greek stories all sort of end this way, with lots of emotional people just murdering each other. I think the moral of the story is just not to murder your uncles when you're mad, or maybe just do the darn rights to your vengeful god correctly in the first place. Like I said, gods are petty. My first few battles with the boar in Odyssey ended pretty much the same way, but instead of Meliger and his family getting slaughtered, I got taken out by the boar's rampaging piglets. Seems fitting considering the boar was pretty much trained by Artemis to ruin people's days. Did you think we were done with the vengeful petty god stuff? Not even close! Another creature you fight in the game is Medusa. The monster you fight is not the original Medusa, but an NPC who has been turned into a monster. In many versions of the myth, Medusa was born a beautiful girl, unlike all her siblings who were monsters. She was turned into a monster by Athena for doing it with Poseidon in Athena's temple. Jeez, Poseidon sure gets around. Not only did she have snakes for hair and turn people into stone, but she also had bronze hands and wings of gold. Medusa developed a reputation for being impossible to kill. So when a wicked king was trying to get rid of the hero Perseus, he asks Perseus to bring him Medusa's head. The hero uses a very shiny shield as a mirror to avoid looking at the monster directly and cuts off her head. Out of Medusa's neck come her children, one of whom is Pegasus the flying horse. Perseus brings back Medusa's head and uses it to turn the evil king to stone, which is one way of getting rid of a boss you hate. Good news for your in-game encounter with Medusa, she is killable. And while she doesn't give birth to Pegasus in the game, you can still outfit your horse, Phobos, in some sweet Pegasus cosplay. Just head over to the store to purchase the Pegasus skin. Sadly, equipping the Pegasus skin doesn't allow your horse to fly, but it still looks cool. Another classic Greek monster who also appears in Assassin's Creed Odyssey is the Cyclops. The most famous tale of a Cyclops is in Homer's Odyssey, which is named after Super Mario Odyssey, obviously. Odysseus and his men find a cave full of food, which belonged to a Cyclops named Polyphemus. Odysseus gets the Cyclops drunk and tells the monster his name is Nobody. While the Cyclops is passed out drunk, Odysseus blinds the poor guy with a stick and takes all his food. When the Cyclops wakes up, he starts screaming that he's been blinded and robbed, and who can blame him? When the other Cyclops asks him who did it, all he could say was Nobody. In this version of the tale, the Cyclops are the children with Poseidon. Go figure. So when Odysseus brags about his clever idea, the sea god makes Odysseus' journey so much worse. In the older myths, the Cyclops are the children of the Titans, Uranus and Gaia. The Titans were the rulers before the gods, but the old guard had to leave at some point, and the Olympians end up killing the Titans in a grand war. So to visualize the weird ancient Greek family tree, think of the Cyclops as the gods' cousins, sort of. They were the helpers of the blacksmith god Hephaestus, and when the volcano Mount Etna would rumble and smoke, it was said to be that the Cyclops were at work. You can find a volcano in the game, and when you enter, Cassandra mentions Hephaestus, but we can't be certain that it's actually Mount Etna. And you won't won't find the Cyclops there either. The first Cyclops you encounter in Odyssey is a little smarter than his mythical counterpart. He's a gang leader who threatens Cassandra. He has just one eye, which Cassandra is always threatening to gouge out, hence his name. But you can find another full-on monstrous lumbering Cyclops later in the game. Like every fight with a one-eyed baddie, just go for the eye to take down this mythical giant. We've covered some myths, but Assassin's Creed is all about historical fiction. Remember in high school when you learned all about ancient Greece? 
us neither. So here's a crash course. The Peloponnesian War was fought between the city-states of Athens and Sparta from 431 to 404 BCE. The conflict was named after the region both cities were located in, the Peloponnese in southern Greece. Nearly all of the city-states were involved in the conflict, taking sides with either Athens or Sparta. The war began when Athens became allied with the colony of Corsera. Land-powered Sparta feared naval-powered Athens' expansion. So when Athens broke their peace treaty after the alliance with Corsera, Sparta told Athens they better chill out or get ready for war. Famous leader of Athens, Pericles, decided that they were far past diplomacy, so Sparta had their ally attack an Athenian ally and all Tartarus broke loose. It's in these fraught and dangerous times that the bulk of Assassin's Creed Odyssey takes place. Moving on to ancient Greece's gentler, more sensitive side. When you think of ancient Greece, you might think of pottery and pristine, white, naked marble statues. There's just something so hashtag aesthetic about those broken stone heads and symmetrical buildings. But science has come through yet again to prove to us that everything we know about history is a lie. First it came for the dinosaurs, then Pluto, and now the sculpture wing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. While the theory that ancient Greeks embraced color has been around for centuries, it was generally laughed at. That is, until recently, when ultraviolet light proved that those famous naked statues were once painted in bright colors with loud designs. And it wasn't just the statues. The temples and other buildings were also also a riot of color. Another hidden yet fun tidbit, bronze statues appear with empty eye sockets because the eyes were made separately from the rest of it. They were exceedingly creepy. Now, how does the, all of this tie into Assassin's Creed Odyssey? When working on the environments for the game, the artist wanted to keep things as authentic and historically accurate as possible which means out with the white and in with the wild rainbow color palette. So while you're visiting the Oracle at Delphi in the game, take a closer look at the architecture. Maybe stare into a statue's baby blues and watch it stare back at you. Both the sculptors and the game developers worked hard on those statues. Delphi was the location of an important shrine to Apollo. It was originally called Pytho, after a story in which Apollo killed a snake at the site. The Greeks believed it was the center of the world. It was said that Zeus released two eagles, one to fly east and the other west, and they met again at Delphi. The stone that stood outside Apollo's temple was called the Omphalus, or navel. The oracle was then called the Pythia, and was the priestess of Apollo. After performing sacrifices and purification ceremonies, the Pythia would deliver prophecies. The oracle at Delphi is a real ass place you could actually go to in Greece. The temple was rediscovered by French archaeologists in 1880 in all its scenic beauty. It's also a real ass place in the game, and you'll meet Herodotus right there after he has an enlightening chat with the Pythia. We may not be an oracle with the wisdom of the gods, but we do have some neat extras that we share with our mailing list. Just go over to leaderboard.nyc slash email to stay in the loop. I predict developer interviews, exclusive videos, and more. Speaking of culture and appreciating the fine arts, one of the best places to check out ancient paintings and designs is at the Acropolis, which the game has dutifully recreated in garish color. The Acropolis is the peak of Athenian architecture and philosophy. After the Persian wars, Athens was the most powerful state in Greece. Pericles ordered the building of the Parthenon, the most well-known building in the Acropolis. When you think of ancient Greece, you probably picture the Parthenon. The Parthenon is dedicated to Athena, the patron of Athens. You can't talk about the Parthenon without discussing Socrates. In Assassin's Creed Odyssey, you get the privilege of meeting the thinker himself, and taking side quests for him, of course. The two things everyone can agree about him was that he was very smart and very ugly. At least he's more remembered for his big brain instead of his face. He once visited the Oracle at Delphi where he was told he was the wisest man ever. To prove it to himself, he went around to all the brainiest people in Athens and asked them questions to prove their wisdom. It turned out that they were all talk and actually knew next to nothing. Socrates was forced to conclude he was in fact the wisest person because he knew how much he didn't know. Jeez, he sounds like he's fun at parties. At least he could be helpful during Jeopardy? He's maybe most well known for his death. The authorities in Athens put Socrates on trial because he often supported Sparta and criticized the status quo. They sentenced him to death by drinking poison. And even though he had the chance to escape to safety, Socrates chose death instead. If that isn't the most ancient Greek thing, I don't know what is. You know what? I take it back. Socrates must have been a party animal. He never refused a drink. So if you want a party like Socrates or just have an oracle tell you that you're the smartest person around, dive into Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And to wrap things up, here are the eight most critical choices in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. 
spare civilians or spread the plague. I'm not sure why you end up in these terrible ethical conundrums in Odyssey, but here comes a big one. The village of Kaosos has been infected with the plague. In order to stop the sickness from spreading to the rest of the island, they're killing everyone that's infected. Stands to reason. The priest tells you that this particular family that your friend Phoebe has sent you to look for is sick, and they're about to kill them to stop the plague from spreading. The villagers plead that they're only a little bit ill, which I don't buy because those guys look terrible. As they beg for your help, you have to make the decision to either choose to help them or let them die. If your white knight tendencies flare up, you'll need to kill the priests and his soldiers in order to free the family. The family, overjoyed at not being killed over what they deem as a cough, tells you that they feel good enough to travel. If you take their reward money, they'll stay put with empty pockets. But if you don't, they'll use that new grant money to travel the island in hopes of finding a cure. Don't you just feel all warm and fuzzy inside? Well, that must be the plague setting. In. The next time you return to Kefalonia, you'll find it ravaged by the plague, whether or not you take their money. If you choose to let the clearly plague-infested family and kids die, then congratulations! You've halted the spread of the plague. Your friend Phoebe is a little miffed at you letting her friend die, but she'll get over it. Patricide or nah. Pretty early on in your mercenary career, you meet Alpinor, who offers you plenty of drachmi to kill a Spartan general known as the Wolf of Sparta. And with all the coincidence of a Greek tragedy, it turns out that said Wolf of Sparta is your friend father Nicholas, aka the man who saw you fall off a cliff as a child. You didn't fall, dude through you. Shout out to Gamora, the only person who can feel your pain. You're eventually able to get a meeting alone with Nicholas. After revealing your identity and the fact that you're still alive, he simply tells you to make your peace with him trying to murder you. I'd say that's just about enough to warrant a spear in his gut. You can choose to take your completely justifiable vengeance against him, or you can choose to spare his life. If you spare his life, you're left plagued with a lifetime of daddy issues, but at least you still have your Spartan honor. Upon sparing him, Nicholas tells you that he's been your step father this whole time, and you'll need to ask your mother for the rest of the family story. He walks off, leaving you his helmet and his sword, and the daddy issues, of course. This is a pretty important decision in Odyssey, because sparing him will cause him to appear later on in the game. If you choose to gut Nikolaus, he still manages to gasp out that he's not your father, and you still get his helmet and sword anyway. However, Stentor, the adopted son that Nikolaus didn't try to murder, arrives on the scene. Stentor forces you into battle, and subsequently gets Spartan kicked off a cliff. Kill the cult members? So bad news for those of you that decided to kill Nikolaus. It turns out that guy Elpinor was a cultist from the Cult of Cosmos. I bet you feel guilty for killing him now. I know I did. The Cult of Cosmos is a secretive organization that operates throughout Greece, observing and controlling things from the shadows. Their true objective is to attain power through the land and artifacts from the first civilization. Sound familiar? This cult and others like it would later develop into the Order of the Knights Templar. I now have some good news and some bad news. It turns out that the sibling you thought was dead, you know, the one that got thrown off the cliff before you did, is actually alive. Maybe there was a bale of hay at the bottom of that cliff. But the bad news is they've been brainwashed by the cult of Cosmos and used as a weapon. And they're kind of crazy with anger and abandonment issues. Hooray? You're gonna run into your brother slash sister a number of times throughout your time in Odyssey. Each time they're gonna want to antagonize you into a fight. It's pretty easy for any conversation with Deimos to develop into a fight because cultists are like that. But if you decide to try and win them back over to your side, you have to be zen about your responses. Whatever you do, don't let them lure you into a fight. Pick passive responses and try to convince them that the cult of Cosmos has been using them. Eventually, they'll come around and get unbrainwashed, leave the cult, and join you and your mother for a game of happy families. Aww. However, if you do try to kill Deimos, I don't blame you. Or if you fail to convince them that the cult is manipulating them, then the cultists win. You'll end up losing your sibling forever. Also, pro tip, don't let Deimos kill your mother if you want your mother to stay alive. Thank you. Save a baby or kill the baby killer. Odyssey throws some pretty tough decisions at you, but this one gets a little dark. In your search for your mother, you discover that she tried to save your baby sibling after the fall by bringing them to the sanctuary of Asclepios. The priest there claims that your brother or sister couldn't be saved, but it turns out that they were actually just baby napped by a cultist. The baby lady Chrysis is a member of the cult of Cosmos and spent her life abducting and torturing children into becoming servants to the cult. When you eventually confront her to find out what happened to your family, she runs away, but not before setting a baby on fire. So now you have to choose, either save the baby from the fire or run after and kill this awful person. Now, this isn't an important decision in the grand scheme, but it's a pretty messed up one. If you choose to hunt down Chrysis, the child is left 
to die, but you do successfully catch and kill Chrysis. If you save the baby, you'll reunite her with her somewhat deluded mother, but you run the risk of Chrysis continuing her reign of terror. Don't worry, we went into the future to check, and you'll be able to hunt down Chrysis eventually in the aptly named Death Comes for Us All quest. Public execution or stealth takedown? The Monger, one of the cult of Cosmos henchmen, has taken over the streets of Corinth. What was once a prosperous port now wallows in corruption. This time, the choice isn't whether to kill him, but how to go about doing it. Anthusa, one of the courtesans, wants you to kill the monger publicly in the theater in exchange for information about your mother. Brasidas, on the other hand, wants you to execute the monger quietly and quickly in a cave so that there's minimal bloodshed in the power handover. It doesn't seem like a major decision as far as the storyline goes, but this decision will affect some of the outcomes of future quests. If you decide to kill the monger in the theater, it'll only steal the resolve of the other cultists. One particular cultist, Lagos, is especially pissed by the time you meet him in the judge, jury, executioner quest. If you kill the monger in public, Lagos will refuse to leave the cult and you have no choice but to kill him. It's not exactly the worst outcome, but it does mean that he won't be able to help you later on. Anthusa will give you the information either way, however you kill the monger. So follow your heart, your icy murderous heart. Leave them on the dark side or bring them to the light. In the quest A Bloody Feast, you're about to accuse one of the kings of Sparta of being a member of the cult of Cosmos. You'll need to go around and gather some proof to back your claim, with the most important details coming from Lagos. You remember, the guy you may or may not have killed in the previous quest? Once you rightfully accuse Pausanias with proof, the people will exile him and you'll be able to kill him without too much fuss. If you did kill Lagos, however, your evidence won't be up to scratch and they'll throw you out of Sparta. You'll still be able to sneak back in and hunt him down in the city, but the guards will be on alert. Either way, he ends up dead and you come back a victorious citizen of Sparta. Bonus decision before the end of the quest, your mother, Myrene, urges you to bring back your sibling who has fallen to the dark side. If you agree, she'll remember that. So if you end up killing your sibling because you were tired of their nonsensical ranting, Myrene gets pretty peeved off and abandons you. Moms are so touchy, am I right? But if you don't promise to bring them back and you do end up sticking a knife in their throat, then Myrene doesn't abandon you. She does get pretty sad though, but she understands that you did what you had to do. Moral of the story, don't make promises that you have no intention of keeping, especially not to your mother. Fratricide or fatherly intervention. Depending on your choices in the Wolf of Sparta quest, you may have thought you killed Stentor, but of course that jerk is still alive and greets you in typical stepbrotherly fashion. He bosses you around and makes you kill a bunch of people because he's still sore that he thinks you killed your father. Dude can hold a grudge. So whatever dialogue choices you choose, you'll end up circling each other ready for battle. If you haven't killed Nikolaus and were kind to him in your responses, he'll step in at this point and tell Stentor to stop the sibling rivalry and focus on leading the troops of Sparta. Keeping everyone alive is pretty important to the whole happy ending and not dying alone thing, in Assassin's Creed or otherwise. Maybe you failed to do all that, or you succeeded in wiping that annoying smirk off Stentor's face by killing him. Whatever your motivations were, you'll probably need to take his name off your Christmas card mailing list. Yes, I know the Greeks didn't celebrate Christmas. Trouble in Paradise Be being a hard-working Spartan mercenary is thirsty work, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey quenches it with a virtual smorgasbord of options. With half-naked Grecians of all genders and persuasions, Odyssey offers it all. And I'd be remiss if I neglected to talk about one of the better romantic side quests. Also, honestly, I need a break from all these doom and gloom decisions. This quaint little love triangle begins where you'd expect it to begin in Greece, on the party island of Mykonos. Mykonos has a tyrant problem in the form of Podarches, and you've been summoned by the lovely Kira to take care of him. Kill him, I mean. Don't get it twisted. We may be on Mykonos, but it's not that kind of party. Not long after that, you meet her lover Thaletis, a young, virile Spartan. The sexual tension between him and Kira is so thick, you can cut it with a Zepho sword. Now, you'll be given the option to either seduce Kira or Thaletis. Picking Kira seems like the natural choice. That ebony-haired temptress really doesn't give you a chance. By siding with her, you go to Delos to fight in the Athenian War. Even though she's with Thaletis, you won't mind being her side piece. The love story between you and Kira is sweet and lovely, probably the best one in the game. But if you manage to resist that siren's call, a secret option with the lettuce awaits you. In order for you to choose the lettuce, you need to side with him in battle. After proving yourself on the battlefield, you'll be able to request a night with him. Or a night with him and Kira. Yes, you heard that right. This triangle has become a tricycle. All three wheels get a turn. In order for you to get any action with the lettuce, however, you need to rev his engine by beating 
beating him in a duel. Both stories are adorable, but pick the lettuce if you want to have your cake and eat it too, so to speak. The consequences to your choices in Assassin's Creed Odyssey can be heartbreaking. Even more heartbreaking are the events that you have no choice over. Pour one out for my Spartan BFF Brasidas, man. But hopefully you made it out with most of your family members at the dinner table. In the end, even if you didn't save anybody, you wind up drinking with your buddies and celebrating life. It's actually not too bad if you think about it. May the Father of Understanding guide us. Because, wow, that was a lot of information to take in all at once. I believe in you and your ability to process it all, though. So, what did you think of our Assassin's Creed Marathon? Which fact is your favorite? What video do you like the best? Do you want to see more Assassin's Creed content on the leaderboard? Make sure you let us know down in the comments and subscribe for more like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.